recognition of guests, the Honorable Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and welcome back, everyone, to the Legislature today. <clears throat> it was a bit of a sloppy drive-in this morning when you're out in the country, but uh, we saw after the last few days, spring is on the way, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I want to welcome those joining us in the gallery. Uh, thanks for coming in. It's always great to see those seats filled. Um, <clears throat> I want to say hello to everyone in District 4, Belfast, Mary River. And uh, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, uh, a couple in Stratford, Corey McCausland and uh, uh, Krista Sentner, uh, are working very hard to, to gather supplies together to send to the Ukraine. And uh, their um, shipment is going out today, and I just want to thank them for the work they're doing, how important it is <clears throat> to show the support we have here in PEI and, and to reach out to, to those in the Ukraine. And uh, volunteer applications are open for the Canada Games. It's less than a year away, and you can visit their website and to sign up. Uh, we look forward to welcoming Canadians from coast to coast next year, and I think it would be a great opportunity. I, I think the, the last Canada Games was 1991. It seems like only yesterday, but a long time ago. So uh, I know all Islanders are pretty excited about what's coming up with the Canada Games. <coughs> um, talk about spring and a sure sign of spring on Saturday, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Belfast Watershed Group um, were at Cooper's and they were selling their tree swallow nesting boxes and t-shirts. And they're $20 each uh, for the boxes and for the t-shirts. And they still have some left, so if anyone is interested, they can contact the Watershed Group or contact myself. I'd be happy to forward that on. Um, great to see them working hard at, at Cooper's. And uh, Jana Simmons is one of the, <coughs> the volunteers. She, she works uh, for us up on the third floor. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I want to thank for her volunteerism in the community. Um, also, Mr. Speaker, the Eastern uh, Chamber Award winners from last week, uh, they had their, their dinner at the Fiddling Fisherman in Surrey, your own stomping ground there, and uh, I'm looking forward to going there myself. The uh, Community Impact Award went to Butler's Clover Farm. The Business Excellence Award went to Chapman Brothers. The new business of the year is Julio Seafood Market and Innovation Award went to Suris, Suri Sauces. So I want to congratulate each of those companies for their hard work. And I want to welcome everyone back, as I said earlier, and have a great day. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. And it is an absolute delight to be back in the House again, <laughs> see all of my colleagues all around me. Um, it's not easy speaking into the void, uh, I can tell you. For a short time, and we've all experienced Zoom, Zoom meetings, of course, and, um, and that's fine, and, and it's a wonderful technology, and allows us to do what we have to do. But you know, you don't, as the leader of the third party and I were discussing earlier, you get no sense of the mood of the room, you don't get any body language, you don't get all of those bits of feedback which are critical in having a, a good conversation. So it's lovely to be back in the House and looking forward to many good conversations today. I want to welcome everybody to the gallery. I see Heather Mullen there, the President of the Home School Federation, and Roisin, nice to see you both. I'm, I'm glad you're here today and the other members who have joined us in the gallery. And uh, for, I want to start off by congratulating the Canadian soccer team on making it to the World Cup. For, First time since 1986. So congratulations to John Herdman, the coach of the team. And you know, as a Scot, I've gone through decades of, of soccer disappointments, <laughs> of not of, of underperforming, and and, and the, the national team just not doing it. Although they have qualified for the World Cup on a number of occasions, they haven't quite got there yet this year. There's in fact their last game, or the, what will determine whether Scotland joins Canada at the World Cup, will be a game against Ukraine, which of course. Um, was scheduled to be last week, but is being postponed. So I'm not quite sure where that stands. But anyway, regardless of that, congratulations to Canada. It's a real triumph um, to have come out at the top of a group which had some extraordinarily strong teams, countries that have you know decades and decades and decades of soccer history. And Canada is relatively new to this sport, relatively new. And I think we're starting to show that we are real world contenders here. And I can't wait to see the World Cup uh, as it uh, unfolds later this year in Qatar, and and I think it will be a little bit warmer there than it was this weekend for the Scottish for the players who were in Toronto um, uh, playing a, 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 the poor folks that so they were playing against Jamaica, and you know it was it's cold if you were Canadian, so I really did feel for the Jamaicans who were on the t on the field. And it, I don't think it got above freezing the whole day. Anyway, fantastic job, and uh, it's it's a real milestone in Canadian soccer. 
I want to just mention a couple of things in my own district. The Canoe Cove Community Association, they're having their monthly meeting tonight at the schoolhouse at 7.30. Um, a, a really fine group of people who keep that community bonded together. And uh, uh, if you live in the area and you want to go down and listen to what's up or contribute to what's going on in that community, take this opportunity. And something I talk about frequently because it's important. It's the development in the new municipality of West River of, uh, of the official plan and the land use bylaws. And they've had a fantastic inclusive process in doing that. The next meeting's due up uh, April 26th, I think it is. And the mayor there and all of her uh, council members and, and community members within the new municipality of West River uh, have contributed to what is a very exciting document. I know that, I know that uh, there's been a lot of engagement from the community and I look forward to seeing more of that in the weeks and months ahead and, and good for them for setting a standard for what it will be like to develop uh, land use plans and bylaws here on Prince Edward Island at a municipal <coughs> level. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise and welcome everyone here to the gallery and welcome everyone back. And as the Leader of the Opposition mentioned, you know, it is, uh, and I can say to him, like, when you have no meetings and things, you do not uh, see the, hear the feedback and see the body language. And you did miss quite a bit last week, Mr. <laughs> Honourable <laughs> Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, I would like to welcome all the UP UPI students here today in the gallery. It's great to see them. Welcome. Mr. Speaker, this morning I attended the grand opening of the new welcoming space at Place de Villas in Wellington, which was recently developed and renovated by Bienvenue Evangeline. The Cossaire Scolaire Communitaire Evangeline and La Saïté de Development de la Baie KDN. These groups, along with the Centre for Francophone Immigration, provide programs to help newcomers settle and engage in Prince Edward Island through services that are provided through connections to the Francophone and Acadian community. The newly renovated center will welcome newcomers and provide a beautiful space for people to gather. I want to wish them every success. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Donald Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise today and watch everyone watching from District 18 Rustico Emerald. Of course, it's a snow day, and I don't know if my son Alex and my daughter Annika are, are watching, but I want to say hello to them anyhow. And Mr. Speaker, I wanted to welcome everyone in the gallery. Um, as, as always, it's tricky to recognize people with masks, but there's a few people. I see uh, Heather Mullen here, of course, and, and uh, her child now, is it Roisin? I'm going out on a limb here. It's just... Roisin. Roisin, thank you very much. I've never said your name, just read it on here, because you're so active on social media, of course, head of the PEI Home and School, and, uh, and thank you so, for all your work as well with PEI School Food, Inc. Yes, very much so. And I see in the back row, of course, uh, it's Hans Connor. It's nice to see you here today, and I, I, I think you have brought some affiliates with you here today. And, and Hans, of course, is known as a, a labor lawyer, I believe, around town here, and works a lot with unions and things. But uh, I also know him on the musical side of things as the bassist of Slung and vocalist also within the same group and, and singer-songwriter. So it's great to see you here today, Hans. Thank you very much. And, and, and Mr. Mr. Speaker, um, I also wanted to say that uh, Tomorrow, I'm really looking forward to participate in a federal provincial announcement. It's one that we've been eagerly anticipating. I hopefully, it's not going to be anticlimactic, but it has to do with uh, rapid housing and co-investment projects. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Minister of Transportation Infrastructure. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Uh, Speaker. So it's uh, certainly a pleasure for me to rise again here in the House today and, and bring greetings to uh, all of the residents in uh, Stratford, uh, Capic, uh, District 6. Um, I want to send out a special birthday greeting to my favorite middle sister, Susan Tierney, who actually resides in Calgary, um, but quite often uh, tunes in to watch the proceedings here. So happy birthday, Susan. Um, and Mr. Speaker, I just want to thank uh, the many, many individuals, the Islanders that have reached out to me since our uh, announcement uh, last Friday with regards to uh, the expansion of our rural transit program, uh, which we announced will be uh, going into Western PEI. Um, uh, we're, we're very much looking forward to getting that uh, on, on the go, and as I said in my comments last week, it's scheduled to start on April the 19th. So, appreciate the positive feedback. I can't wait to see the the uh, the, the ridership uh, on those routes and as it grows as well. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, I also want to uh, bring to everybody's attention a, a, an incredible story that was uh, in, uh, in, in the news today about uh, a young 13-year-old actually from, uh, from your district, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Brady Chason, who has been using the rural transit from uh, Surrey to Charlottetown every day since it started last fall. And uh, this young man uh, attends the Mount Academy here in Charlottetown. Uh, for the first uh, couple of months, his parents were driving in, but as soon as we announced the, uh, the rural transit for Eastern PEI, uh, he and his family took advantage of this, and, and uh, Brady uh, rides the, the transit every day and, and uh, sings its accolades. And finally, Mr. Speaker, uh, yesterday I had the opportunity to, uh, to uh, meet one of our newest family physicians that has come here to PEI. Actually, this, this physician moved here from North Carolina. Uh, Dr. Zimmer. He's at the Sherwood Medical Center. I uh, had a, and a great opportunity to sit down and, and chat with him and talk about uh, lots of things uh, related to the healthcare system here in PEI and comparisons to the U.S. So I welcome uh, Dr. Zimmer and his family here and uh, look forward to uh, many more uh, educational conversations with this uh, medical professional. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty, Third Party House Leader. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a great pleasure to rise, say hello, and good afternoon to all my colleagues and especially everybody watching from uh, Charlottetown West Royalty, District 14, and I and, uh, hope you enjoyed the proceedings today. And um, welcome everybody in the gallery, gallery Heather, Rasheen, good to see you again, and, and everybody watching. And, and to let you know that that is Hans Connor, and I'm glad that you came and you brought some students here. And uh, Mr. Speaker, this is the this is the climate change management in Canada environmental class. So uh, it's great to it's great to see them here. So we have we have Zoe Furlot, uh, Nolan Crescent, uh, uh, Lauren McDonald, and Nellie Haldon. So uh, welcome, and I hope you enjoy the proceedings today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Education, Lifelong Learning, Minister responsible for the status of women. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's certainly Hey, and welcome back all my colleagues and hello to everyone watching and in District 9, Charlottetown Hillsborough Park. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see so many in the cat gallery today and, and so many familiar faces. Heather Mullen, our, our wonderful president of the Home and School Federation. I don't know what we do without you. You're, you're incredible, so thanks for everything you're doing and it's nice to see your daughter, Roisin. Um, grade 12? At, the, at Colonel Gray? Great, grade 10 at Colonel Gray. Perfect. Yeah, I can't get anything. <laughs> um, grade 10 at Colonel Gray and, and Hans Connor and, and students. And um, Ms. Shree, I'd like to welcome Ricky Burns into the gallery. Uh, Ricky is a neighbor of mine and a longtime family friend. Uh, I can remember when I was young, Ricky would drive my brother to uh, hockey in the early evenings as my father was a school teacher out in Surrey Elementary, and it was sometimes tough for him to make it back to practices or games um, for those evening times. And of course, Ricky was always there for, for my brother and our family, and he would jump the opportunity to help. Uh, many of the members in here and viewers uh, watching probably know Ricky Burns. He's a fixture in the local sports community, but is best known for his volunteer work with uh, five pin bowling. He has taken on many notable roles and has coached both adult and youth teams for over 40 years. I want to take this opportunity to congratulate Coach Ricky, Coach uh, Shizlane Bernard, and Team PEI's 2022 uh, Youth Challenge team, who has just returned from Calgary after competing in the Canadian Youth Challenge Five Pin Bowling Championship alongside youth ages 12 to 19 across our country. And I, I do want to say thank you, Ricky, um, for your dedication to our community and your volunteer work. The island and our youth are better because of people like you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and welcome to my constituents in Brighton and elsewhere, listening online, and of course, to all the gallery visitors. Uh, I completely agree with, uh, the, with our leader that, uh, that uh, being online, this, uh, virtual is good, but in person is better. There's, however, one area where actually virtual is better, and I'll refer to uh, one of my frequent listeners online, John Terrar who uh, not only listens in, but uh, is able to, unlike people in the gallery, to comment as proceedings go along. So uh, if I can't get the proper information on wood chips from the government members here, he knows the answers and <laughs> will uh, send them right to me. 
Anyway, Norway on PEI is a slow return to normal appreciated as much in the, as in the cultural sector. While there were great efforts and generosity in reaching out to the public by virtual means, we all know that person to person cannot be beat. So it was last Friday night when the Confederation Gallery opened to a season of exhibitions to around 100 people. Aside from viewing the great art being displayed, such occasions are also great for whole hobnobbing well Charlottetown citizens. For instance, I had a chat with our Honourable Mayor of Charlottetown discussing the benefits of building active transportation paths at the new Simmons Centre, if it keeps that name, instead of expanding parking for cars. This was suggested by Mrs. Harbour, a planner who also happens to live in my riding. And yeah, it's sad to note that uh, that government officials tend to want to do two things at the same time. They want to kind of go the green way, and then they want to do something for people with cars as well. Uh, not always a good idea. I know that the provincial government is not directly involved in this project, except by being a financial partner, but I hope you'll help, help make the right decision happen. It is details like this that really makes it possible to reach the net zero goals that you have set. We should not plan the future for more use of cars. I was also delighted to meet our new ombudsman, or I should really say ombudswoman. As it happens, she's also now living in my riding with her husband. Mr. Speaker, as you and the honorable members probably already know, the word ombudsman is a Scandinavian word and while the institution was first established in Sweden in the early 1800s to help citizens caught in bureaucratic nightmare, it was not until Danes established a similar office in 1953 that the international community noticed the need for such an office. So, Mr. Speaker, a big welcome to our new ombudswoman and again, Islanders, please support and enjoy your cultural industry community by participating safely. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honourable Member from Mermaid Stratford, the Opposition House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to rise. Hi to everyone watching from Mermaid Stratford, and welcome to everyone from the gallery. It's great to see uh, lots of people tuning in and joining us today in person. Um, first of all, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to give a shout out to the Birchwood Girls AA basketball team who won the finals on the weekend. Um, the girls, they competed and completed a three-peat with an undefeated season, which is just amazing for those, for those young girls. Um, they rolled to a victory over East Wilshire, so we're happy to take that one home with us. And uh, lots of girls that are going to be moving on to uh, high school next year, so thanks and congratulations to everybody. Um, and Mr. Speaker, I think it's important that whenever we get to um, highlight um, some really great restaurants in our communities, we should do that, especially when they're being operated by, um, you know, people like immigrants that have come to Prince Edward Island and bringing their culture and giving us the opportunity um, to experience that. And Dragon Feast is located in Stratford, and it's a, it's a restaurant that does dim sum on Saturdays and Sundays. And many of you may not have even heard what dim sum was. I didn't even know about dim sum until I moved up to Ottawa. And my sister said to me, it was this great big ballroom style restaurant, multi, multi uh, floors. And my sister introduced me to it. And she said, just say yes. Say yes to everything and you won't regret it. And so my family and I went on Sunday to Dragon Feast to uh, experience their dim sum. And let me just tell you, those flavors were incredible. And I highly recommend that you try them out because it's really a, it's a really great experience. And um, also, I, I went to the new location of STEAM PEI, which is down at the Assembly of First Nations new building down on the waterfront, and what a stunning building that is. And uh, Amber and Jacob Jadis um, have opened a really cool maker space, and uh, it's just a great location, and it's not officially opened yet, but it is a soft launch, and it's a great place to take kids and, and uh, experience everything that STEAM has to offer. And finally, Mr. Speaker, I'd also like to share um, at 8.47 a.m. this morning, I was notified that there was only one ambulance available across the island. That ambulance was situated in Vernon River. So when you think about how long it would take to respond from Vernon River to Tignish, that is not the way that we want to be, rep that we want to be servicing rural islanders here in this province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
The Honorable Member from Time Valley Shorebrook and the Opposition Whip. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's a pleasure to rise today, uh, say hello to everyone watching from home and to everyone here uh, in the gallery. It's always nice to have um, a full gallery when we are um, having our proceedings here, so welcome. Uh, I wanted to just uh, speak about something that the Minister for Transportation and Infrastructure spoke about in his greetings, and that's the expansion of transit into the West Prince area. Um, I'm also hearing from constituents who are really excited about this. It is, it is, it is certainly very well needed and, uh, and, and a welcome announcement. Um, I did want to take a minute, though, just to, to share some of the questions I've had. So there's, you know, we don't have the schedules up for this transit yet. So there are a lot of people who are calling me wondering, well, when are we going to know where the buses are actually going to go? And that's really important, right? Because when people are making decisions about whether or not they can take employment in a certain area or whether or not they're going to need to, you know, uh, how often they're going to need to use a vehicle, you know, we, they really, they need that information. So I think it's April 19th is when that service is set to start. So really, we, we should have those schedules out uh, hopefully very, very soon because there are questions. I also want to mention that uh, residents in Slemon Park are asking about uh, access to transit. Uh, I haven't heard anything specifically about whether or not Slemon Park will be included in this transit route, but I want to just stress here that there's 260-ish homes uh, in Slemon Park, and it's a very isolated you know, community uh, in terms of access to, to transit. It's not really walkable distance. It's not walkable distance to Summerside. So um, you know, we really do need that transit to go out to Slemon Park too. So just throwing that out there, this is what I'm hearing from folks. It's great to hear that transit is happening, as the minister said, but uh, I want to stress, you know, get those schedules out there and, and make them accessible because folks need it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Morrell, Dona, and the Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's been a year or two since I got up in, in uh, greetings, to be quite honest with you. But uh, there's just too much District 7 content today to, to not uh, get up and speak. Um, I'd like to welcome uh, uh, Roisin uh, to the gallery. Uh, if anybody would uh, like to follow Roisin's uh, art, uh, her crafts, and, and her, her incredible art skills, uh, Roisin. Uh, Mullen Art uh, on Facebook, it's amazing. And I would encourage anybody, if they happen to be going to uh, meet anyone in the Premier's office, uh, to go early and take their time to look at the Premier's Art Gallery there. It's amazing some of the work that's there. And on multiple occasions, I've luck been lucky to see uh, Roisin's uh, artwork there as well. So it's uh, quite nice. Uh, welcome, Heather, uh, as well. Um, and we appreciate all your work with the Home and School Federation and the Peers Alliance, too, as a, as a director, Heather. I really appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, the Minister of Education had mentioned uh, uh, Ricky in, in the uh, gallery here. He would have no idea who I am, Mr. Speaker, but uh, it has to be 30 years ago he would have coached me in the provincial youth bowling team, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. So I do appreciate all the work that you've done. It's been a long time since the Morrell Bowling Alleys were there, but uh, I do appreciate it. Mr. Speaker, um, uh, Hans uh, Connor is here with the, the classroom, the School of Climate Change and Adaptation. and. I, th I think you're, you're, this course is out in St. Peter's, right? So this is, if it's not the first, it's one of the very first courses to ever be put on at the new uh, Climate Change Center in St. Peter's. And Mr. Speaker, that is a big deal. And it shows, yeah. Um, you know, we, we, you know, sometimes we get, to, you know, laughing, carrying on about rural PEI and, and, and you know, and uh, you know some of the bias that some of us rural members might have towards it, but it's real, Mr. Speaker. When you invest in rural PEI, it pays off, and there's big things happening out there, and that's really exciting. So welcome to our area. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Did I miss anyone? No? Member statement. The Honorable Member from Cornwall, Meadowbank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I was going to jump in on members' statements, but I'll, I'll incorporate Ricky Burns in, into my member statement today. Um, Ricky Burns was actually probably my first boss. Um, as a 14-year-old boy, I opened the rink at the Sportsplex for the Ball Hockey League during the summer. So uh, yeah, Ricky would have been my first boss. And my mother-in-law actually ran the canteen um, at the Sportsplex for years, so Ricky was even at our wedding. So uh, nice to see Ricky here today. Um, also, I'd like to echo the comments from the Minister of Transportation to welcome Dr. Zimmer to PEI. He actually lives in Cornwall, new resident um, that lives down the street. Um, that all being said, uh, as we all know, we're seeing the events from UK Ukraine having a devastating human impact. We cannot Im imagine the fear of public buildings being bombed and fearing for your life and, and fearing for your freedom at almost every moment. Last week, Mr. Speaker, The Guardian featured the story of Vadim Bolotin. Vadim escaped Ukraine to join 
his daughter, Irina, and his granddaughter, Veronica, and both of these families live in Cornwall. I had the opportunity to talk with Vadim's granddaughter, Veronica, a few days ago about Vadim's journey to escape U Ukraine, and I can tell you, thankfully, that not all the details of his journey were shared in that Guardian article. The reason I am recounting the story to, uh, this story to the House is that I want to acknowledge the help of our community to Vadim. At 77 years of age, Vadim has mobility issues, and on the day the newspaper article was published, a resident in Cornwall made a social media post looking for equipment to help. In less than one day, our community was able to obtain a wheelchair for Vadim and other mobility equipment to aid him at home. I want to pass on thanks from the family for this generosity. As I explained to Veronica, this is just what we do as Islanders. Mr. Speaker, further to Cornwall's support of the people of Ukraine, I want to let the House know that the Cornwall Quick Stop, otherwise the ESSO, located on Main Street in Cornwall, which is owned and operated by Bob Car Carmichael, has stepped forward and created a draw for $2,000 worth of gas, whereas all proceeds are being donated to the re relief effort in Ukraine. Tickets are $10, and the draw is March 31st, so please drop into the ESSO and help support this effort. I'm fortunate to live in this community, and we are all fortunate to live in PEI, where we always lend a hand to our neighbours. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty, and a third-party house leader. Our island children are our future. We hear that over and over, but do we stop to think about some of our most vulnerable, our children in care? We do, consider, do we consider how the government is legally and ethically required to support them during one of the most difficult times in their lives? They've, been, they've usually been uprooted, often the only family and community that they have ever known, for their safety under the assumption that without removal, they would continue to be in a dangerous situation. I will say what we already know, social workers who support our children in care are stretched to the limit. Currently, they are working at significantly reduced staff and complement. In 2019, about 40% of staff had left permanent positions. In 2020, 38% left their positions. And as the middle of October 2021, an additional 20% left, and so it is possible for the year it could be up to 40%. Has government asked these social workers why they've left? This is speculation, but I highly doubt it has much to do with the clientele, the children they are there to protect. It is clear the government and this minister is not providing supports to these social workers, and that suggests that the minister doesn't have an effective retention plan. As a result, we are losing the trust we could have built with these professionals. What is government going to do to demonstrate these, to these vulnerable children that government is, in fact, going to support their growth, development, and well-being if we can't even staff our own system with the appropriate professionals? We owe it to the children, their social workers, and the community to play an essential role in developing, promoting positive growth in vulnerable children's lives so they are strong, healthy, and provide, provide the tools, supports, and confidence needed to be our future. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Tignesh Pomeroy, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This past weekend once again proved that access to emergency health care in West Prince is not a priority of this government. On both the past Friday and Saturday nights, we've seen the emergency department closed at the Western Hospital. A temporary lack of staffing was the reasoning provided. After dealing with staffing shortages and closures at Western Hospital for years now, I fail to see how government can continue to call this lack of staffing temporary when it continues to happen repeatedly. Last week in the legislature, I questioned the Minister of Health and Wellness about the closure at Western Hospital and the ambulance services in West Prince, reminding him that this area is his backyard and the people that this government continues to put at risk are his neighbours. I also directly asked the Minister if he could honestly tell the residents of West Prince that they are safe in the event of an emergency situation. The Minister would not answer this question. Instead, the Minister referred to current and previous budgets, talking about how the services in West Prince have improved, and patted himself on the back and the government. We continue to hear about days where there is one or even no ambulances available for the entire province and that the one that may be available is Park and Hunter River. This is not acceptable and is putting Islanders at a substantial level of risk. In my perspective, continuing to see closures at Western Hospital and the unacceptable state of ambulance response times across the province shows anything but improvement. 
we have seen tragedies occur, occur in an area that may have had more positive outcomes had the West Prince area been appropriately covered for emergency services. They, those choosing to live, work, and contribute to rural communities on Prince Edward Island should never have to feel that by doing so could jeopardize their ability to access emergency health care when they need it. Unfortunately, that is exactly what will happen if this government does not immediately come up with a sustainable emergency services continuity plan for West Prince. Thank you, Mr. President. End of statements. Questions by members, starting with response to questions taken as notice. No? For a first question, I'll call on the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. On Friday, uh, during debate in this House on government's new carbon pricing plan, the Premier attempted to defend his government's policy of collecting islanders' money and then not returning it to them as a direct rebate. Many other provinces have adopted an approach that sees almost all of the money collected through carbon taxation rebated directly to their citizens. That allows people to make up their own minds as to how they want to spend that money that best suits their unique circumstances. A question to the Minister of Finance and the Deputy Premier. Why does your government think it knows better than islanders themselves how to spend their money? The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. So the leader does may not know, but uh, he should come to understand that the Finance Minister collects the tax, it's my department that decides how it's spent. So. Those questions should be directed at me because it's my department that's deciding how these funds get spent. And I find it a little bit comical that the, the leader of the opposition over there is touting Alberta as the prime example for attacking climate change. Well, Alberta is one that has exactly what you're saying. They took the backstop. So Alberta took the backstop and they fought with Ottawa. They took Ottawa to court. They said, we won't tackle climate change. We don't even believe in climate change. That's not the way it is here in Prince Edward Island. During the greetings, we talked about the students who are learning about climate change in a climate change school in, in St. Peter's, Prince Edward Island. We are leaders in climate change, and it's because of the decisions of this government, and quite frankly, the previous government and Ottawa today, that we are. As far as what the, the, the uh, uh, leader of the opposition believes over there, he can believe what he wants to believe. He can vote against the bill if he chooses to vote against the bill. He can wrap his arms around Alberta all he wants. We're going to tackle climate change. We're going to help people make a transition because that's what we believe we should do. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. So much to unpack in there. Firstly, it's our prerogative, of course, to direct our questions where we wish, and the Minister of Finance is the mover of the bill under debate, and that's why I chose to direct my questions to the Minister of Finance, and that's absolutely my right. Mm -hmm. The reference to Alberta, of course, they did indeed take the federal government to court, and they lost. And this government, this government, the one I'm sitting looking at now, applied for intervener status on that case. So please... Don't try and separate yourself from what they did in Alberta because you were in exactly the same boat. When we started debate on this bill, government had not given this House any idea how they were going to spend the money. The official opposition learned more details through a Guardian article than it did in this House or through a departmental briefing earlier last week. To the Minister of Finance, the mover of this bill, and the Deputy Premier, how can you expect island MLAs to make informed decisions when we're not al allowed to have the information needed to do so? The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Honourable Member, I would like to clarify that the bill that is on the floor of the House is about collecting the revenue so that we can then distribute it. You can debate, you can debate where the money is going on the floor when the Minister is on the floor with his department because that's where it will show uh, where the money is going to go, where, where the wonderful programs that we have for all Islanders. We, we do not want to give them a check and not have... We, Give them a check. Is that going to make a difference to the environment? Yes. You tell me how someone who is minimum wage or lower can afford a heat pump or can do something different with $800. Mr. Speaker, we are taking the money that we have and giving Islanders heat pumps. We're helping with uh, EVs, electric vehicles. There are a number of programs in place. But I will remind the Honourable Member again 
that the bill that is on the floor is about collecting the money, not about distributing the money, and you will have the opportunity to discuss that with the Honourable Minister of uh, Environment, Energy and Climate Action when he is on the floor with the bill. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I find it quite astonishing that the Minister of Finance thinks it's a bad idea to give $800 checks to islanders. It just blows my mind. And the idea that they have to spend that money on a heat pump or putting solar panels on their roofs, that is not the intent of this at all. And you should understand carbon taxation much better than that. If you look, if you look at the information provided to the media, the information that we were not allowed to see, if you look at the information that was provided to the media, me uh, information that the official opposition and the third party never saw, it's clear that some of the expenses claimed as being funded by the carbon tax aren't at all. Heat pumps, for example, that program existed long before carbon pricing came along. Same for electric, same for electric vehicle chargers, and same for renewables in agriculture. Exactly. Exactly. To the Minister of Finance and the Deputy Premier, why are you suggesting that these programs, these are great programs, absolutely, but why are you suggesting that those programs which operate outside the carbon tax budget are indeed funded by carbon taxes? Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So I don't know, obviously the Leader of the Opposition doesn't understand how a budget comes together. He doesn't understand this tax, clearly doesn't understand this tax because all we are doing is we're, we're incrementing it up like we're being forced to by Ottawa. And we're taking that new incremental money and we're giving it back to Islanders. Everything that was there before was there before. You're 100% right. All that stuff was funded before because it was there before. We've ramped it up. We've added, uh, we, we have the subsidization for the uh, AT fund is in it. We subsidize the rural transportation. We paid that down to Tooney Transit so that we can have island-wide transit on PEI for $2. We're helping people get free heat pumps so they can transition over to a cleaner electricity. I don't know why the Green so Party Prince of Isle would possibly be against transitioning over for climate change, but it's very clear, Mr. Speaker, that they are. Thank you. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. As always, there's some interesting things to pick up from when the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action stands up. Uh, to suggest, of course, that the, that the official opposition is somehow against any of these programs is complete nonsense. Preposterous. We think, I mentioned in my last question, these are great programs, but for goodness sake, separate out the money coming in from carbon taxation, give it directly back to islanders, the islanders who need it most, exactly. fund these programs in another manner. Yes. The whole debate here seems to boil down to how much government is prepared to invest in fighting climate change. This government is saying that we can have either full carbon rebates or robust climate programs. So we on this side of the house say you can have both. In fact, you have to have both. And if you're not doing both, then clearly climate, the climate emergency is not an emergency to you. It's not a top priority. Exactly. And keep in mind that this whole budget line that we're talking about here is less than 1% of the overall provincial exactly. budget. And there's huge pots of federal funds available for those other yeah, programs. Exactly. A question to the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Change. Why does it have to be one or the other? It can't, it can't it be both? If we're fighting climate change properly, you have to fund it properly. Is this a priority of your government? Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So it's funny to hear from the leaders of opposition over there finally talk about climate, finally talk about oh, climate change on. here, finally talk about the environment. No, I've sat here for three years and you're scared to death to ask me a question and suddenly, oh. you know, suddenly you're the bravest man in here when you're against something that we're doing. You're the bravest person in this whole building when you're against something that we're doing. Funny, Mr. Speaker, how funny that is. What, what's so dangerous about what the leader of the opposition is saying is he's wholly wrong. And not only is he wholly wrong, we're leaders in this country. We're viewed as leaders in this country by our federal counterparts. We're viewed as leaders leaders in this country by islanders mr speaker and if we took what the green backstop was if we took that that party's position today and took the green backstop on friday furnace oil will go up 13 cents and and gas will go up seven cents because we're currently paying that down because we worked with ottawa and they've given us an, another year exemption on that deal so if you want what if you want what the leader of the opposition wants prepare to pay through the nose on friday thank you mr speaker Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Well, Mr. Speaker, 
What's always interesting is how this government likes to tell only one half of the story, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. You're not mentioning that if the price, the carbon price, goes up, then the rebate goes up too. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the central part of this carbon pricing plan, where the bulk of the money goes, is the rebate on gasoline. You only get that relief or the benefit of that if you buy more gas. It's completely backwards. It's a subsidy on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. When defending this on Friday, the Premier said the federal government holds PEI up as a gold standard. Mr. Speaker, question to the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. You're welcome. Are you seriously <laughs> suggesting that the federal government is encouraging other provinces to subsidize fossil fuels and reduce their oh. gasoline taxes too? Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So what I can tell the Honourable Member is the reason we've got it is because other jurisdictions have gotten it. So when, when Stu Neepy asked me questions Friday about why, did, why bring it in so late, it's because the negotiations went really long is what I told him, which is the truth. And because negotiations went real, really long, we got to keep that exemption that's going to keep gas lower at a time when it's at a worldwide high. So I'm actually really happy. While I don't disagree with you that we need to transition away from that, doing it all this year would have been a terrible idea. Had we had to bring in a seven cents raise on the fuel on top of the spring that islanders have seen, uh, that wouldn't be good news for any islanders. So I'm glad that they're there, but that doesn't mean that you're wrong, that, that it has to go away. And I think the federal government wants it to go away. And what I told Stu Neepy on Friday is I suspect it'll go away in this round of negotiations. And it's just a matter of how quickly will it go away? Will it go in one, one year? Will it go over three years? And it will depend largely on what other jurisdictions uh, get for a deal. I think that's what it, what it boils down to. But when I talk to the, the, the federal, federal minister, we've never really talked about that part of the file. We've talked about the part of the, the great things that we're doing, how we're trying to transition quickly, and how we need their support. And quite frankly, Mr. Speaker, I feel like we have it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I must say I don't have great faith in the negotiation um, you know, skills when you've had three years to negotiate this. It could have been... you soften the landing is you spread it out by doing it with one week's notice it's going to be a hell of a bump whatever happens mr speaker we provide relief to islanders impacted by the carbon tax but we shouldn't do that by reducing the gas tax instead we provide relief by giving people cash not tied to how much gas they use or don't this government's approach says they don't trust islanders enough to give them the opportunity to make their own decisions question to the same minister. Why are you still providing the bulk of carbon relief through a fossil fuel subsidy instead of just giving people the cash, $800 in your words, that they could spend however they need? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Like I, I said, I think if we had taken it in all at at once this year, it would have been a really, really bad spring, even worse than it was for Islanders. So I'm thankful that it, it didn't go away. We know it's going away, so we know we, nego we're, we will have to negotiate that away. And, and I, do want to, I, I do want to take a moment to caution the member over there. It's all great that we take shots at one another. I don't negotiate th these things. It's my staff, and they don't deserve to be run down by you in here because they, they are negotiating with Ottawa. That's absolutely, that's wholly unfair. No, that's absolutely, that's absolutely unfair. I don't sit in the room with them. I don't. That's, it was a cheap shot. You're right. The leader of the opposition recognizes it's a cheap shot, and, and, and he is right. It was a cheap shot. It's not fair to my staff. If you want to take a run at me, fine. I do not negotiate carbon tax. Just so you know, I, I'm not the one who. Oh, I have staff to do. Would you really want to look around the room and get have a politician negotiating this? We need people who deal in this every single day. I have more in my job to do than than this. Like I have all kinds of files inside my department. If I was only negotiating carbon tax, I wouldn't be able to do any of the other things. So I have staff doing it. So apologize to my great staff. You do a great job, regardless of what they say. Charlottetown, Belvedere. You know, what I'd like to hear is an apology to the people um, in PEI who are low income, who are left out of the plan, Mr. Speaker, because we've heard the Premier talk about low income households who can't afford to participate in these programs. And I would remind this House that there are 30% of households in PEI that rent. They can't get a heat pump. There are tenants at Slemon Park under the Plemon Park Housing Association who can't get a heat pump, right? There are people being left behind. So when we talk about all islanders on this side of the house, we mean it. 
And what we mean is that some households, like tenant households, do not have control over their heating. They cannot buy an EV. They do not get afford a heat pump. So a low-income household is not in a position to make those changes. Why are we downloading the responsibility onto the lowest income to mean that they have to go first, Mr. Speaker? A question for the same minister. Do you think that a low-income household may be better off to reduce their reliance on fossil fuels if they got $140 back in a dividend or $800, as you mentioned earlier? So again, in order to get what the honourable member over there is saying, which would never be, be $600 a year is all it would be, would, would amount to a uh, $0.13 cent rise in heating fuel. It would, it would amount to a $0.07 cent rise right away in, in gas. So, I mean, you're going to pay for it one way or another. What we've done instead is we've chosen to invest that money in $2 transit rides anywhere on Prince Edward Island, which I think is important to help all islanders transition to a, a carbon-free economy, Mr. Speaker. We, we've, uh, we've talked about our free Young Riders program, where Young Riders can ride the bus for free. We have our free heat pump program, M Mr. Speaker, which, which will, all islanders will get to benefit from it. We, I, as I already told this house, we were, we'll work with the owners of those facilities, and I've already worked with some to pilot how we could work with them in order to install heat pumps so that everybody does get to benefit from them. Because we need them to switch to electric sources of heat regardless. So we will be going after landlords and telling them they have to switch to ele electric heat sources because we have to decarbonize, and the, the tenants will be the beneficiary of it, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but, but as far as taking it to where they want to take it this year, Islanders have had a tough enough spring. They've been hit hard enough at the, in the pocketbook at the, at the pumps and when they're filling up their, their fuel tank. And quite, quite frankly, I'm glad that we got the deal that we got, not the Green Deal. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. John Valley Sherbrooke. When I heard about the cough and fever clinics uh, that they would be closing, the first thing I did was check what the walk-in clinic hours are in Summerside since the direction from government is for Islanders with respiratory issues to go to their family doctor or a walk-in clinic. And do you know what I found? There are no walk-in clinic hours at all in Summerside this week. None at all. Question to the Minister of Health. With the cough and fever clinics closing, how are folks in the Summerside area supposed to take your advice and go to a walk-in clinic when needed if the walk-in clinic isn't even open? Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member for the question. Certainly it is a good question. Uh, with uh, the cough and uh, fever clinics that are closing, yes, on March 31st, that decision was made, Mr. Speaker. It was a physician-led decision, and uh, I, have, uh, I have complete confidence in the decisions that our professionals do make, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Time Valley Sherbrooke. So, okay, so that didn't really answer the question at all. And Mr. Speaker, you know, you might suggest, or the minister might have suggested that this closure was temporary, but I want to say that, however, issues with this clinic have been going on for years. A lack of hours at this clinic is an ongoing issue similar to what the minister is dealing with with his own community and the Western Hospital. Mm -hmm. My question is to the Minister of Health, who represents Western PEI, are you asking our constituents to drive to Charlottetown to receive basic health care? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And what I would say to that, Mr. Speaker, is that the Honourable Member references Western Hospital. Well, Mr. Speaker, in this year's budget, there are an additional 5.1 FTE nursing positions at Western <laughs> Hospital. So maybe the opposition, if they want us to get moving forward on these initiatives, should look at passing the budget. Thank you. As my colleague just noted, officials from Health PEI have indicated that the walk-in clinics and family doctors should be who Islanders go to now that they are closing the cough and fever clinics. Question to the Minister of Health and Wellness. Has there been an increase in capacity of family physicians and walk-in clinic hours anywhere in this province that you haven't shared with Islanders? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank the, the member for uh, the question. Again, I go to a couple of things there, Mr. Speaker. These decisions are made by the experts. They're not made by myself. I have confidence in the experts. Yes, we do have uh, uh, additional needs right across the province, Mr. Speaker, with regard to primary care provision. With that, that's one of the reasons of it, Mr. Speaker. But we do have the contract with 811 
but we do have virtual clinics, Mr. Speaker. We are moving forward compared to what the previous administration had done. We are looking at initiatives. We look at the recruitment that has taken place. But yes, Mr. Speaker, as Minister, I will be the first to admit that we have a lot more work to do, and I look forward to doing that work. Mermaid Stratford. There are currently only three, walk -in, three hours of walk-in clinic time in Eastern PEI and equally dis dismal in Western PEI. Emergency departments are closing, or sorry, closing earlier, not even opening. Rural Islanders are being underserved for health care, which is starting to look like the norm from this self-proclaimed rural government. Minister, how can you justify the lack of access of health care services in rural PEI? Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I think uh, you look at, at the initiatives. Uh, you look at the medical homes that we are rolling out, that we are going to be promoting. That is what we have a vision. We are not thinking just within the box, as some uh, former administrations did. We are looking outside of the box. We are looking at things that the College of Family Physicians of PEI and the College of Family Physicians uh, right across the country have endorsed. As I said, Mr. Speaker, do we have more work to do? Absolutely. And I look forward to working with the experts in getting this job done. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Islanders can't visit your vision. I have a constituent, a constituent of mine had needed cancer treatment, and they could not get the treatment because another chronic illness was not under control. Without a family physician, they had to use the emergency department, and the emergency doctors um, had to write their referrals to specialists. This isn't working for any for anybody. We have a page of registry nearing 23,000 Islanders. There are Islanders on that list whose health is deteriorating every single day. They can't go to the ER for options. These Islanders with, have, with complex health needs, often seniors, um, need, um, need better service than the ER, sitting in an ER for hours. Question to the minister, will you provide ER physicians the ability to flag patients who, based on their expert knowledge, immediately need access to primary care providers so that the patient registry can prioritize those islanders with the greatest needs? Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, it's uh, great to hear the member uh, use uh, that term, experts, because that is who I rely on, Mr. Speaker. You know. Okay, uh, that's who I rely on. And as I had said before, Mr. Speaker, yes, we have work to do, but we're doing it. We are going to continue working. I, as minister, am going to continue working with the experts. We have to get this right. Unfortunately, I wish it could be with a snap of a finger. It cannot be, Mr. Speaker, but we're going to continue working, and we are going to be doing and providing the services that Islanders do need, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Honorable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, my question today is to the Minister of Environment. Minister, the Premier likes to continue, continually bring up about the previous administration's carbon plan of giving free licenses and vehicle registrations to Islanders, saying this incentivized carbon emissions. The Premier seems to forget that those who drive electric vehicles also need licenses and registration. Mm -hmm. And the only people that seem to be upset with it were the people across. Because mm -hmm. most Islanders were happy when we gave it to them. They were upset when they took it away. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The plan for the administration that actually supported it was those affected by the price increases at the pumps. Mm -hmm. The ones driving to work every day from rural parts of the province. This one, this government, seems to have forgotten about those people. Mm -hmm. Question to the Minister. $140 a year at most. Why does this carbon plan you brought forward hurt our working class people in this province? Oh, that's the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. I guess because we took your plan and we took the new carbon tax and we're giving it back. So you're our basic argument is your plan is what you're doing, Mr. Speaker. Double leader of the third party. This is your Mr. plan. Mr. Speaker, just this a little your just, plan. Uh, my next question is shorter, but just a little preamble before I get into it with your indulgence. I'm glad to hear this minister said his staff do a great job and he doesn't have anything to do with carbon tax because I'd like to read you a little short paragraph from 2018 Hansard from, minister, from, seconds. Mister, 25 seconds. from the minister. <coughs> I'm against carbon tax, not because I'm a climate denier or any other accusation that were made here, not because it's politically convenient, nor because I'm trying to win the next election. 
quite frankly, I'm against it because I'm against it. So I'm glad to hear that his department's making the decisions, not him, and be anxious to see how he votes when the bill comes to the floor. Uh, Mr. Speaker, question to the minister. This government at least tailored one of their programs to higher income earners, because the only people who can afford to benefit from the $5,000 rebate are people who can afford a $50,000 car. Question to the minister. You can say the former plan incentivized carbon use all you want, but why did you create a plan that penalizes people who can't afford to make the switch to electric vehicles or simply can't find one available here on PEI? Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Well, there's a lot to unpack there. And I think I said on, in Friday in question period that I wasn't necessarily, still wasn't necessarily for a carbon tax. This is mandated by Ottawa to us. That doesn't mean that we're not willing to, that, that doesn't mean that I'm not willing to attack Climate change. I think it's been very clear. Our path. We have a. We actually have a plan. When your government was in in, in power, you did give away free licenses. You said that's our plan. We're going to go reach carbon neutrality. There was no work done. So we put our we put our shoulder to the wheel. We come up with a, a strategy to to attack it. We intend to attack it. We're going to be very, very aggressive on it. And and as you know, I will give you credit because the reduction in gas tax that the Green Party wanted me to take away today is $13.2 million, and that's yours. So you guys did that, and we were allowed to keep it. And that is to keep the prices low at the pump so that people, that the, people the exact people that you're talking about won't be impacted. And that's exactly why, why we kept it. We, we kept it because we didn't want to transition it all at once and make that. And you're bang on on your EVs. Like, they're really expensive, and, I, and there's nothing I can do about it. We, our plan really as... Uh, you know, we may not have, have explained it well enough, but was it intended to get EVs here on the market so there was a used market, so that the trickle down would be that other people in the market space would be able to buy them used somewhere down, down the road. It's going to take a long time. I don't disagree. There's some mandates coming in from the federal government that are going to help that. As all the, the car companies are coming online and building EVs now, the prices will probably come down. But no, you're not wrong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Now the leader of the third party, 25 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, a question to the same minister. Last week, your premier said he'd be disappointed if myself and our caucus didn't support th their plan. This minister says they put their shoulder to the wheel. Well, they were pretty quick to take away the free, free license and the free registration. And then they had two and a half years to do something, and they didn't do anything till last week. Mm -hmm. Now, shoulder to the wheel, wow. <laughs> You know, you should be worrying about more, not so much us four being disappointed. You should worry about islanders that are disappointed in this plan, because there's many islanders that are not helped by it. Question to the same minister. You had years to renegotiate this plan. You inherited what experts call one of the best plans, and, you, and your rebate programs are not inclusive. Is this, is this plan the result of more procrastination and the reactive responses that your government continues to do? The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Thank you. And I do want to point out to the, the Honourable Member, I, it doesn't bother me a bit that you four are disappointed in me. That uh, actually makes me quite proud. It makes me feel like we're on the right path. It makes, we're doing, it makes me feel like we're finally doing something that you guys refused to do for so many years, Mr. Speaker. And you guys all got behind Wade, Wade McLaughlin. You rode his coattails. He was going to be the shepherd. He was going to lead you guys in. And then he had absolutely no pay. And it was more important for him to balance the budget than to help anybody. And we're over here helping Islanders. We have two knee transit right across Princeton Island. That's being paid at a carbon tax. We have free heat pumps for low-income Islanders. That's being paid at a carbon tax. We, we support the Island Nature Trust to buy land, and that's out of the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. All stuff that would have been unheard of under the cheapness of Wade McLaughlin. So you guys can keep pounding the Wade McLaughlin drum all you want. I, like most Islanders, am glad he's gone. <laughs> As you know, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I like to take a sip every now and then, and uh, so I want to touch base on an issue uh, from the PEI Craft Beer Alliance, who represents the nine breweries here on the island. Microbreweries are important economic contributors to our province, and especially the ones in rural areas such as Moth Lane Brewery and the Ride in Valeria Inverness. However, some of the current government regulations uh, in place do not support these businesses and simply do not make sense, especially in an environment of high gas prices and inflation. Question the Minister of Finance. If a local brewery can deliver kegs of beer to island customers, why can't they deliver bottled beer or canned beer to the customers at the same drop-off point? 
The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And Honourable Member, that's a question that I ask as well. Um, I think, uh, first of all, uh, we're modernizing the Liquor Act as quickly as we can, and that's something that we're looking at and we'll continue to look at. And um, thank you for the question. O'Leary and Furness. Okay, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, there's another issue that they raise here too, Mr. Speaker, as I go down to Moth Lane Brewer every now and then for us to try to have a nice ale. The province charges 25 cents per litre on, as an off-site remittance tax to be paid to the PEI Liquor Control Commission for beer, wine, spirits sold directly by the manufacturer to the customer. I emphasize the beer goes from the processing tank to the customer's glass, no Liquor Control Commission involvement. Question to the Minister of Finance. Those breweries hire local workers, use local products. These breweries were hard hit uh, by the pandemic and the government restrictions. Will you commit to either reducing or lifting this unfair tax? Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker and Honourable Member. Um, <clears throat> the breweries, I think, throughout the pandemic, tried to transition and do things differently. Uh, one thing that I'll point out to the member is under the former administration that uh, there were uh, some different regulations brought into, into play for the, for the craft brewers, and I think we have to look at that, but we also have to look at um, the fact that there is a health tax as well, and that's not something that, they're, uh, that they implement so, or pay. O'Leary and Furness, your second supplementary. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, I mean, uh, obviously the government over the side doesn't really worry about whether there's deficits or not, so let's take some taxes off here. Don't worry about that stuff. Recently, the PEI government made changes to the Liquor Control Act that allows customers to enter a restaurant, take their own wine and consume it, and uh, have a permit for recorking. But for beer, that's not allowed. Why the discrimination, Mr. Speaker? Uh, will the minister commit to allowing beer growlers to be open and consumed at island restaurants similar to wine? Be fair. Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and Honourable Member. I appreciate that question, and I will bring it back to the Department once again. I have no problem doing that. Uh, we work continually with, with uh, all of uh, island retailers that supply liquor and with the restaurants, and I think the fact that you can bring a bottle of wine is great, but I think uh, if we can find a way to do the growlers, we will. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Cornwall, Medibank. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to stay on the beer topic, but unfortunately, I want to go back to carbon reduction. Um, <laughs> uh, increasing use of public transit is one way that we can help reduce our carbon emissions. Recently announced investments to increase coverage and improve affordability for Islanders, helping to reinforce the long-term commitment to that goal. Question to the Minister of Transportation. How much infrastructure exists in the province to support ride sharing or park and ride options for Islanders looking to lower their travel costs and carbon footprints? The Honourable Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action. Was it you? Yeah. Okay. Helios. The Honourable, member of trans Honourable <laughs> Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. He's not used to getting up, so now he's just automatic reflex. He's getting up and down and up and down. Uh, Honourable Member, thank you very much for that question. As, as you're fully aware, um, there are uh, several uh, uh, park and ride uh, uh, lots uh, spread across PEI, uh, particularly in, in rural PEI. But you know, as we uh, as we expand our infrastructure here in PEI, uh, I'll, I'll say, for example, the uh, displaced left-hand turning lane at St. Peter's and, and the new uh, double highway that goes out uh, through uh, St. Peter's heading east. Uh, we did uh, construct a new park uh, and ride a lot there as well. Uh, my deputy actually had a meeting with the working group this morning to uh, look at other locations across PEI and it's something that uh, we're very uh, invested in and we feel that uh, the more options that we give islanders to uh, either carpool or park their car and jump on the rural transit for two dollars, the better it is for everyone. Thank you Mr. Speaker. Carl Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A website issue too. I looked at the T3 Transit uh, website, and there really is no mention of park and ride locations there. So I think we need to talk to T3 and, and improve uh, that information. Uh, building a durable transit system takes time as people go, go through slowly the phasing down their vehicle usage in favor of giving transit a try. Things like park and ride spaces can be a way for individuals or, or groups to explore greater transit use. They can drive part of the way, safely park their vehicle, and then hop on the transit to go the rest of the way. Question to the Minister of Transportation. Is having more islanders use park and ride spaces to feed transit ridership a goal being pursued as part of the province transit plans? Honourable Minister of Transportation, Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, Honourable Member, thank you very much for this uh, question. And, and yes, as I said before, it's a very important part of the infrastructure uh, that will assist islanders uh, to either carpool, 
uh, and or even better to get on, uh, on, on our transit system for $2 a ride. Uh, the, you referenced the T3 Transit. Uh, the T3 Transit actually is, is, um, is um, uh, run by the, uh, the three capital region municipalities, Charlottetown, Cornwall, and Stratford. Uh, we've had several conversations with them, and, and uh, if there's something in particular in Cornwall that, that you're seeking, I would uh, certainly uh, encourage you to reach out to uh, the council in Cornwall to advocate for, for uh, a car lot there as well. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Cornwall Metabanks for second supplementary. Thank you. I do agree with you that there's an opportunity to encourage more transit in my area and surrounding communities, maybe like Morale or even Vernon River, to better access uh, park and ride space. For me, I would need to walk about 25 minutes to the nearest bus stop, and although I do need that exercise, Mr. Speaker, a total of a 50-minute commute to the bus stop may not always be convenient for me. If there was a park and ride space in my community, I would consider a short drive there and having a spot to safely leave my car there and then hopping on the bus to go to Charlottetown. I can think of at least one space in my community that may work well as a park and ride. I'll more or less answer this question. If a community organization or municipality was looking to explore adding in park, park and ride spaces, what's the process that they need to follow to get that ball rolling? Donable Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So the process, first and foremost, would be to uh, identify the location to see who the ownership is of, of that, uh, of that uh, space, uh, to work with that municipality, and then that municipality would work with the, uh, the operator of T3 to, uh, to uh, ascertain and determine whether or not the, uh, the routes can be changed. Um, the routes here, uh, particularly on the T3, are very, very tight in times. Uh, recently, we were looking at making some changes into the West Royalty Industrial Park and the Bio Commons Park um, to make it safer for pedestrians to cross the road. And we were told at that time that uh, unfortunately the timing of the, the, the routes was so close that they weren't able to do that. So what we're doing as a government is we're putting in safe crosswalks in several locations across the Upton Road to make it safe for pedestrians. But you know, Honourable Member, I'm certainly willing to work with you willing to work with the municipalities to do whatever we can to make transit more accessible for all islanders. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Morel Dona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our social workers in the province are performing vital work in often uh, very, very difficult uh, situations. Um, sometimes they're bearing witness to situations that you know, at the very least, we can call it uh, traumatic, Mr. Speaker. Um, I've heard some some pretty, pretty heavy situations. Uh, a question today to the uh, uh, Minister of Social Development and Housing. Has the department explored any ways to make enhanced uh, mental health supports available for the employees who are experiencing trauma as part of their jobs in social work? The Honorable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I really do want to thank the member for raising this issue because our social workers, uh, in particular during the pandemic, have seen an increase in workload. Um, and, and, and frankly, they've had to be very innovative to try and reach out to those. And, and uh, they've seen, uh, seen some severity. And they, they always do really tough work. And it is, it is National Social Work Month, and, and we need to recognize them, and we need to support them in what they do. So these are discussions we have had uh, within the department. And um, uh, Mr. Speaker, I've had the opportunity to actually travel across the island and meet uh, most of our social workers in the department. And uh, I'll continue to make sure that they have the sports they need. Thank you. Morel Dona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, earlier this winter, uh, the province launched what's called the Public Safety Calls. Uh, it's a new bilingual mental health program designed to support the unique needs of public safety personnel. Uh, this confidential evidence-based program uses online-based cognitive behavior therapy and coursework to help participants. So I was actually uh, speaking to the Minister of Justice and, and he was telling me that the uptake is good and it's, it's working out uh, good for many of our first responders in the province, Mr. Speaker. Uh, question again to the same minister. Would you be willing to look at this initiative or something like this that could be adapted to support the mental health needs of our social workers? Honorable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. And, and, um, and I, I want to thank again the member for bringing this up because our social workers deserve so much recognition for the really difficult work that they do. Uh, Bruce Davison, who's the president of the uh, um, Association of Social Workers on PEI had reached out and, and, and was really advocating for his members, saying they really need their, that recognition and wanted to make sure that we, we actually did recognize them here in the legislature, and we did the other day with the Minister of Education, Minister of Health, and I. And, and Mr. Speaker, I think this is a great suggestion that the member from Morrell uh, Dona brings up, and uh, we'll definitely uh, bring that to my director uh, of child protection and, and, and uh, 
I'll talk to the ministers of, of education and, and health and wellness as well and see what we can do to support all our social workers. Thank you. Morel Dona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and I appreciate that, Minister. Um, uh, you know, we, we've heard numerous examples of our uh, health care professionals in the province and the burnout and the staff morale and, and how it's hard to keep these employees long term, especially now uh, people that are coming in. Uh, I've heard from about social workers that, that are, are leaving. Sure, we've got a number of them that have been there for 30 some years, but especially the new ones that are coming in, they're, just, they're simply not lasting because of this uh, workplace burnout. I think, and, and I know it's expensive, and I know it's, it's, a, it's a heavy investment, but paying for things like psych assessments and the follow-up counseling early on in a social worker's career is going to be expensive, but I think it's going to pay off long-term for our province because we need them, especially in these traumatic situations. Will the minister also consider looking at the real value of these expensive upfront costs, but how it's going to help us uh, retain our social workers? Honorable Minister of Social Development and Housing. Well, uh, thanks, Mr. Speaker. And the, the member um, has touched on a point, and it is something that uh, we're, we're trying to increase our recruitment and retention if you, um, efforts in, in to, with social workers and to invest uh, m money up front because we know it's going to pay dividends in the way he talks about is something I'll definitely take under advisement and we'll explore. Obviously, we have the government, <clears throat> the EAP program, and maybe we can enhance that. Maybe it has to be separate, something specifically for social workers. But uh, I'll definitely look into that because uh, I, I agree. Um, yeah, this upfront investment, uh, just like the member from Charlottetown West Royalty always talks about wellness. If you can invest something to prevent an illness, then you're going to save money in the long run and help people, more importantly. Tom Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Firefighters are calling for the Workers' Compensation Board to expand the list of cancers considered a workplace injury for firefighters to include more cancers that directly affect women. Mm -hmm. This is a measure that has recently been taken in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, firefighters put their lives at risk day in and day out. They absolutely should be covered for harms caused by this work, regardless of gender. Question to the Minister responsible for workers' compensation. Will you show Island women firefighters the respect they deserve and ensure coverage for cancers that <coughs> specifically impact women? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Honourable Member for, uh, for the question. So, actually, I had a meeting this morning on uh, this exact issue, and uh, I want to make sure that uh, any cancers that are caused on the workplace are, are covered. Uh, so I've uh, asked the Department to go back to workers' compensation to expand on this, because I, I really think uh, it needs to be done, and uh, like I say, we're, we're looking into it now. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier this sitting, the Premier said that the new Child, Youth and Family Services Act would not be pushed through until it has had full and proper consultation, including with the child and youth advocate. This is an important piece of legislation for island children and youth, and I want to make sure that it's still a priority for this government. Question to the Minister for Social Development and Housing. You've had a few weeks to update your plans on this critical new piece of legislation. What is your plan? Uh, well, thanks, Mr. Speaker. And so uh, we're doing exactly uh, what, what the Premier said, and, and we, we want to make sure that this, uh, that this piece of legislation is as strong as it possibly can be. It's critical for our, our children and youth here in the province. And, um, you know, the Office of the Child and, and Youth Advocate uh, obviously was not satisfied with where we were at. So we've had one meeting with them already. There's a second meeting scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, we're going to dig uh, deep into the issues. Uh, the Office uh, of the Child and Youth Advocate has provided uh, samples of, of how they like to see things change. And, and we're going to work it out. And, uh, and uh, I thank the member for any uh, input she has on the matter as well. Thank you. Somersai Beaumont, final question. Mr. Speaker, the Autism <clears throat> Coordination Act requires an annual report from the Education Minister. The 2020-2021 report is still outstanding. Actually, the last report was tabled in June of 2020, which tells us both that COVID is not the cause of the delay and also that the report is now nine months overdue. Question to the Minister of Education. When will we see this long overdue report finally tabled? Master of Education, Lifelong Learning. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. I know the report is complete, and I will um, go back to staff and ensure that we can get this report tabled immediately. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. End of question period. Statements by ministers. Presenting and receiving petition. Tabling of documents.
The Honourable Minister of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. By command of our Honourable Lieutenant Governor, I beg leave to table the 2020-2021 Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture Annual Report for the period ending March 31st, 2021. And I move, seconded by uh, the Minister of uh, Public Justice and Agriculture, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Anyone uh, miss anyone? <laughs> Reports by committees. The Honourable Member from, from Charlottetown West Royalty and the Third Party House Leader. Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Standing Committee on Health and Social Development and following the receipt of the Committee's Report on Committee Activities on March 25, 2022, I move seconded by the Honourable Member from O'Leary and Verness that the report of the Committee's be adopted. Your Committee is reporting on its activities since last reporting on November 17, 2021. Since then, your Committee has met 12 times to consider a number of important topics, including in-depth discussions on topics of drug facilitated sexual assault and a continuation of your committee's review of the services provided at the Community Outreach Centre. As a result of its deliberation, your committee is pleased to make the following recommendations to the member, members of the Legislative Assembly. On the topic of drug facilitated sexual assaults, your committee recommends that government collaborate with municipal and federal police forces in the province to implement mandatory training in a trauma-informed approach for first responders. Your committee recommends that government explore implementing mandatory reporting for suspected cases of drug facilitated sexual assaults from hospital staff to police services. Your committee recommends that government reach options for implementing a court that specializes in cases of sexual and domestic violence. Your committee recommends that government collaborate with municipal and federal policing partners in the province to focus on efforts to recruit and retain gender diverse police officers with the aim of improving outcomes for survivors of sexual assault. Your committee recommends that government continue to support the PEI Rape and Sexual Assault Centre to ensure the survivors of sexual assault have ready access to essential supports. Your committee recommends that government implement education and public awareness campaigns that aim to inform all individuals um, in the prevention of drug facilitated sexual assaults and how to best respond in the event of su suspected case of drug facilitated sexual assault. On the topic of the Community Outreach Centre, your committee recommends that government organize an independent review of services provided at the Community Outreach Centre. Your committee recommend that government foster ongoing public consultation and engagement with the Community Outreach Center. Your committee recommends that government develop and publish terms of reference for the Community Outreach Center working group that clearly outlines its mandate, purpose, roles, responsibilities, and reporting structure. On the topic of emergency shelters, your committee recommends that government ensure the implementation of the three recommendations outlined in the 2019 report, finding a community needs assessment on emergency shelters. On the topic of long-term care, your committee urged government to ensure public and private long-term care facilities are consistently operating with an appropriate standard of care. Your committee recommends that government review the standards of confidentiality agreements that help PEI staff are required to sign to ensure the health care workers are able to voice concerns. And I just want, wanted to add, Mr. Speaker, I'm incredibly proud to, to chair and be a part of this, this great group of MLAs who really, those recommendations in here took a while and, and they, they mean an awful lot and, and the committee did a did a great job because these were tough topics to to sit through and listen to because there was a lot of pain and I hope these recommendations are as the chair I hope these recommendations are applied and, and thought about very very thoughtfully so thank you mr. speaker anyone else like to speak to the report I will speak. 
The Honourable Member from Morrell, Donna, and the Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to uh, echo that. Um, you know, I've been part of uh, quite a few committees now over the years, and uh, the uh, the debate and discussion, especially over the recommendations after you're gathering all that information up, uh, has been quite robust with the committee. And uh, you know, it's, it is. It's not easy sometimes, and we just, obviously we don't agree certainly all the time too. But uh, you know, there are some really good recommendations there, and there has been a lot of time and effort uh, put into that. It, you know, painstakingly each and one and every and I think that's deserved, especially of the topics that were there. So I just want to, to recognize that, Mr. Speaker, there is there's extra uh, significant uh, time and, and energy went into that. So I'll echo that, and, and uh, I'm in support of, of the of the uh, committee report. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I, I don't usually speak to um, reports when they come to the floor, but I really felt compelled to speak to this one. Um, this, as, as the, the member from Moraldona just mentioned, um, this committee seems like a, it, it was, it's been a pretty special committee in terms of the different topics that, that we've got had the opportunity to debate and discuss. And it's been, I learned so much from this committee and it's really helped inform and drive the work that, that I continue to do. And in particular, I really, I would love to thank the members of the committee. Um, in particular, when we looked at adverse childhood experiences, which we could incorporate into every single meeting in that in that committee and, and in any committee. And I, I just really wanna thank the members. I can, I honestly, I say this from my, with my counseling hat on, I, I get goosebumps when I see how the language that we use in this legislature now about trauma. And I feel like we're finally starting to understand that trauma has severe effects on our brains as we grow older and it, it stops us from being healthy, um, adults. And so I just really want to thank the members of this committee for the work that you do and thank everyone who came in to share their experiences with us. And thank you, Mr. Speaker. Anyone else that would like to speak to the report? Should I carry? Carry. Uh, Introduction of government bills, government motions, orders of the day, government. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of Health and Wellness that the first order of the day be now read. Charlotte Carey. Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. The Honourable Minister of Finance, Deputy Premier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move second by the Minister of Health and Wellness that this House do now resolve itself into a committee, the whole House, to take into consideration grant of supply to Her Majesty. Sure, Kerry. Sure. The Honourable Member from Tignes Palmer Road, Deputy Speaker, the Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, please. This is now the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the grant of supply to Her Majesty. A request has been made to bring a stranger onto the floor. Shall it be granted? Yes. Honourable Members, we left off on page 36. The bottom section, Apprenticeship, has been read, has been carried. 
I'm moving on to the total workforce development line in a moment. Sure. So we have some take backs uh, that are being tabled. They will be copied and distributed. Please state your name and position for Hansard. Shannon Burke, Director of Finance, Department of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture. Thank you very much, Shannon, and welcome. Thank you. So again, page 36, the line total workforce development, 34,924,300. Shall it carry? Yes, sir. Total Department of Economic Growth, Tourism and Culture, 41,324,500. Shall it carry? Yes, we're now moving to page 38, Innovation PEI, Corporation Management, Appropriations provided for administration of the Corporation Administration, 227,700, Equipment 12,500, Material Supplies and Services 20,000, Professional Services 50,000, Salaries 1,259,800, Travel and Training 42,000, Total Corporate Management 1,612,000. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Chair. Um so the Innovation PEI annual report refers to a summary of the strategic plan on page nine of that report. Um, but I can't seem to find a copy of the full report online anywhere. Is it available uh, publicly? The strategic plan or the innovation? The strategic summary of the strategic plan. Uh, the summary, but I don't have the doc. I don't know where I the plan is. I will have to confirm. I was told it was, but uh, I don't have that access. So let me, uh, I'll have to get back to you on that one. Time Valley Sherbrooke. And, and whether or not, you know, if it's not online, you know, can you bring that back? Just, yeah, uh, yeah. definitely. Perfect. Yep. Thank you. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Um, so can you just tell me a bit about what are the um, current uh, strategic priorities for innovation PEI? So obviously the last couple of years, um, we haven't been, eight, we've had to do a lot of uh, business attraction uh, virtually, which has been a, a challenge for a lot of the staff. Um, so we've been able to make connections with uh, a, a lot of the, the businesses that we've been uh, looking to uh, bring to Prince Edward Island, as well as our, a lot of our uh, local companies now that are uh, looking at expanding as well. So uh, this year is focused on uh, basically bringing the relationships back. Uh, you're probably going to see a lot more traveling through Innovation PEI um, uh, to, uh, to promote and, and to try and uh, drive some of the attractions back here. Uh, this year is another year of uh, simplifying, um, basically changing, every, every year changes through Innovation PEI. Uh, we want to make sure our programs um, are, are clear. We want to make sure that uh, the business community feels the support uh, that's there. Because uh, there's obviously every day you, you, you hear about a gap that you just didn't know about. So um, over the last year we've been able to uh, uh, I guess decrease our programs, not so much decrease them to not utilize, but to expand them and make them uh, a little more simple to navigate. So, uh, so that's an, another priority this year. And uh, and uh, like I say, we've been working with companies, and now we're we're trying to get them across the finish line. Hi, Valley Sherbrooke. Okay. And um, how do workers factor into these priorities? Through Innovation PEI, um, there wouldn't be much on the worker side on Innovation PEI, so that would be more uh, on the business side. Most of the, uh, the workers' um, uh, incentives and initiatives would fall under Skills PEI. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Thanks, Chair. So I'm going to give you an example where I really do think that the, the okay. perspective of workers would really fit and, and sure. should be considered here. Thank you. Um, uh, so one of the areas uh, for which financial assistance is provided through Innovation PEI is job creation. So I'm wondering if there are any conditions on funding or any criteria um, in this area based on, you know, working conditions. So, you know, the quality of the work, the wages, is it a full-time position, is it a full-year position, is it, you know, um, do they offer benefits? Like, do, are any of those factors considered um, in, in, in those programs? So they would be under the late labor rebate side of it. Um, so one thing we've been able to do since we've come in is uh, increase, um, I guess, the, the wage for labor rebates. Uh, so there was a time that uh, 
that uh, I believe the threshold was $35,000 approximately, give or take a couple thousand. So we've changed that and, uh, and made it uh, significantly higher on that before we give it the labour rebates. Because the job creation that we want to bring to PEI, we want to make sure they're good paying jobs. And uh, we don't want to, uh, I guess, incentivize low, uh, low wage jobs. That's, uh, that's something we're, we're not looking at doing. I'm Valley Sherbrooke. Okay, that's really that's really great to hear. Um, so, can you tell me what that threshold was increased to? I don't know if I have that in front of me. I believe it is in the vicinity of forty-two thousand, but I don't quote me on that. I want to confirm. I think we've jumped it between seven and eight thousand. Um, but let me get back to you on that one. Time, Valley Sherbrooke. And. Um, I wonder if you can discuss a little bit about how Innovation uh, PEI reviews its programs and how often they are reviewed. So we've just reviewed the programs. Uh, that was the first time that I'm aware of in, in within about 10 years. Um, so um, I guess when my critic, Charlton Belvedere, uh, was my critic, that was uh, an issue that she had brought to me. So uh, we sat down with... Uh, uh, with the honourable member as well as the, the third party critic at the time and uh, we went through the programs uh, uh, around the table and kind of what we needed to work on and what we need to improve on and uh, between the department and correspondence we were able to do that and uh, so that just took place and I believe the programs we've got them down to 18 programs now that uh, are, are I guess more simple to navigate and covers more criteria so which is good it's, uh, it's been working so far. I'm Valley Sherbrooke. Okay and you know as a uh, Result of that process or any other ongoing processes to review the programs, I mean, were there any um, uh, measures uh, determined in terms of how, measures of success for those programs, um, like how you assess, you know, the value for money and the effectiveness of, of these expenditures? Is, can you tell me a bit about that? Yeah, there would have been. I, I don't have any of them details. Uh, a lot of the programs were looked at of what was being utilized, what wasn't being utilized. Uh, dollars wise, are we leaving any dollars on the table? Are we uh, short dollars in some programs? So. Um, it was probably, I'm going to say it was about an eight to ten month process from start to finish and uh, there was some good work done be, uh, behind the scenes uh, that the department worked on. So uh, obviously we're, we can continue to change at any time if we run up with hurdles, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's where we're at now. Time Valley Sherbrooke. And I think that, you know, whether or not the program is being utilized or not is an, one, you know, sort of variable that you would measure, but then also, you know, is each program achieving the goals that that uh, the program is set out to achieve, right? So, um, you know, I, w I would be interested if you have any anything else to report on, um, you know, how how those how that's measured and and what sort of measurements you've, um, uh, you know, determined in, in terms of the success of each of those programs. That would be really interesting to see. Sure, as well. I can uh, I can bring something back from the people that worked on those programs. Okay, thank you. Time Valley um, Just one more question in this section for me. Um, uh, and I'm not sure if it is in this section, but I think you said the special leave fund was under Innovation PEI. Did I get that right? Or maybe I, I may have missed The special leave fund is administered. Beyond the Department of Finance. Yeah, so the, the money's coming out of the Department of Finance, but it's being administered through Innovation PEI. Administered Time through. Valley Sherbrooke. Okay. Um, so, uh, can you tell me a bit about then, from I guess from an administration perspective, how uh, you know how successful that program was, or not successful? What some of the challenges were? Um, the program, I guess, was quite unutilized, but that was more because of the federal program that was out. So, the first uh, defense line that people went to was the federal programs, and if they had no luck on, on that end of it, then they would would come to us. Uh, for an example, I had one uh, last week that. Uh, uh, exactly, exactly that. Um, so we were able to help navigate them through the program. So I think you're going to see more of an uptake once the federal programs don't exist any longer. Then we're going to have a bigger uptake, and we're prepared to keep that program going till next fall. Hi, Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you. And I'm wondering, are there also plans then to expand that program to cover um, what the federal program had been covering? It's being worked on now. I don't have all the details yet, and obviously I have to get it through Treasury Board, so I, I can't speak too much on it, but it is being worked on. Okay. Time Sherbrooke. Because I think that that's very important. It's, it is great to hear that those programs will be extended into the fall, and incredibly important, right, because we do still have, um, you know, uh, people who are, um, you know, getting sick, unfortunately, sadly, uh, from COVID and other other things that have always been an issue, right? Um, so, you know, making sure that people have access to those sick days will be critical. Um, and it's good to hear that you're willing and, and or have committed to extending the programs, but 
that program was designed right to uh, lead into the federal program. So if there is no federal program to lead into, the Correct. program is no longer, as we talked about just a couple minutes ago, achieving the goals that you had set out to achieve it with that program. So that's absolutely critical. So, you know, I, I appreciate the issue with um, Treasury Board and that that has to be approved at a time when you know for certain when those programs, federal programs, will end. But I just I want to stress how how critical that that is. That continues. Um, that's all for, for me right Shall now. a section carry? Carry. Total corporation management, 1612000 Shall it carry? Shall it carry? Carry. Business development, business attraction, and emerging sectors. Appropriations provided for leading the attraction of new businesses and business partners to the province which complement the provincial economy. Salaries, 981400 Travel and training, 72500 Total business attraction and emerging sectors, 1053900 Shall the section carry? Time Valley Sherbrooke. Um, thank you, Chair. So uh, according to the 2020-2021 uh, annual report, uh, Innovation PEI attracted five new business investments to PEI with projected employment of 34 positions. Um, so how many businesses are you on track to attract in the current fiscal year, and how many new jobs does this represent? Mm -hmm. So during the most recent fiscal, 21-22, um, they've attracted six new businesses with projected employment of 146 positions. Of how many, sir? 146. Okay. Time out of Sherbrooke. And so when you are, um, you know, looking at the, the, the jobs themselves, as we were talking about earlier again, do you have any information on, um, you know, how many of those jobs would be, you know, at a living wage, how many would be full-time, full year, how many are seasonal, like what that breakdown looks like? I don't have any of that here, but I can certainly bring it back. Uh, my guess is saying that um, they would all be livable wage and there would be no minimum wage or seasonal positions on that, but I will confirm, but I'm, I think I'm safe to say they would uh, all be relatively good paying jobs. I'm Valley Sherbrooke. Okay, yeah, if you could bring that back, that would be certainly. great um, to, to have a look at that and, and certainly would be welcome news to know that all those jobs were at a living wage, so that's great, uh, should that be the case. Um, how many businesses do you expect to attract in, attract in the 2022-23 fiscal year, and how many jobs? I don't have that projection in front of me. Um, so we've really just started to see the travel pick up, I guess, over the last 30 days. Um, so I will definitely uh, get a quarterly update. Um, but, yeah, I don't have any of that information in front of me. But uh, what I can tell you is everybody's back, and uh, they're doing what they do best and, and trying to attract now. Time Valley Sherbrooke. And can you tell us a little bit about what the uh, what the government, what the PEI government typically does as part of the business attraction process, and and how much does it, how much are we spending on on business attraction, and in what areas? Um, the majority would be what's in this division here. Okay. Um, so your salaries and uh, travel, and you'll just see some, kind of some ups and downs <coughs> in the travel, just related to to the restrictions that were in place. And there would be a little bit in marketing when we get to trade. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay, so so travel is is kind of the main mechanism that, that you use. Would that be like going to conventions, or I mean? Yeah, a bit, a bit of both. Convention shows. Uh, yeah, individual companies. Um, we've seen the officers go right into individual companies that express interest coming to PEI. Uh, and they range. They could be a smaller company to a, to a bigger company. So um, basically, they're they're looking at uh, uh, the fit for PEI. Uh, obviously, we're we're, we're attracting uh, a, a wide uh, range of, of companies here. But uh, I find uh, from what I've seen in the, the short time I've been in this portfolio that the connections being made with the staff and innovation PEI are, are, is really what's helping bring uh, bring uh, these companies to PEI. Tiny Valley Sherbrooke. Yeah, no, and uh, I can definitely appreciate that. I wonder if you've also explored, you know, kind of expanding into other areas or other approaches to attract businesses, like that would, um, you know, attract businesses in specific areas. So let's say in IT or digital, you know, based businesses, because they might, you know, those uh, business leaders might be more comfortable sort of in, you know, an, an online forum. I don't know if, if travel is always the only way to attract a business, I guess. Or have you explored new? Oh, cer certainly. Yeah. So uh, when I say travelers, there's a lot of traveling involved 
all through this department, but there is much uh, on the phone and online, if not more than, than anything, right? So a lot of it is uh, is done over a period of time, so it could take a couple of years of, of uh, on the phone, Zoom calls, meetings, uh, before there's an in-person meeting. Uh, and a lot of times we want to uh, to welcome these companies to PEI to see what we have to offer. So it uh, it's a... It takes time. There's a lot of times uh, I've seen it, it's two, three years to develop a relationship to get these companies here before they do uh, make the commitment to come here. Time Valley, Sherbrooke. And what's the typical success rate for businesses we attract? I don't have that here, but I can certainly check. Uh, I would think it's relatively high because we, uh, we've put a lot of time and effort and a lot of homework. We try and match uh, the companies up the best we can to PEI's needs. Um, so I don't have that exact number, but I'll uh, be happy to bring that back. Time Valley, Sherbrooke. Yeah, I'd be really interested to know that as well. Um, you sure. know, I'm sure that again, just I'm new to this portfolio, but I assume the you know annual reports have provided information on um, the number of uh, of businesses that have been attracted year after year. So it'd be good to get sort of some you yep. know, follow up stats on how many have stayed, how many have been successful, um, you know, and and are there businesses that have failed and then why? Right. Yep. So we can address those issues. So. Um, Around labor rebates, uh, I'm noticing. So I, this is this is an honest question. I'm, I really don't know the answer to. You, so I'm going to ask. I mean, all of them are honest questions, but this is a technical honest question, I guess. Mm -hmm. I was looking at your annual report, and um, the uh, the numbers for labor rebates in the annual report don't seem to line up with um, what's in the budget handouts. So. Um, and I, I think I may just be reading it wrong, but it looks like there could be like almost a $9 million difference. So I don't, so in, it's page 13 in the annual report, I believe. I'm right. I might have written down the wrong page. Definitely page 10 from your handouts. It's in another section here, honorable member. We're just gonna try and find it. Oh, labor rebates. Sorry, I'm in the wrong section. Yeah. It's under programs. Oh, okay. when we get to programs. Okay, we can I'm come back Sherbrooke. to that. We can come back to that then. Sorry. All right. Um, does anybody else? Is there anybody else on the list? Or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Honorable members, we're having difficulty hearing. Could you please uh, just keep the level down or take your sidebars uh, outside the room? Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay. So. Um, okay. So if our labor rebates are under another section. Hmm. Okay. So which strategic sectors are you focusing on attracting or growing? Uh, there's a few. Um, there, I, I don't have the whole list in front of me, but obviously aerospace. We've seen uh, aerospace go uh, through a, a couple of years challenging times, so uh, that, is, uh, that is one we're committed to focusing on now, and uh, there's positive signs that that's, that's coming back. Uh, the bioscience, um, we've seen significant uh, uptake in bioscience. Uh, over the last couple of years here, and there's uh, there's a big opportunity for PEI. The numbers of growth are, are significant. Uh, the manufacturing side uh, is another one. Uh, IT is huge. Um, we've really put a focus on IT uh, over the last few years as well uh, through the division. So uh, I can get a list of exactly all of them, but there are four that come to my mind now. Time Valley Sherbrooke. And where does clean tech fit into these priorities? So clean tech, we're going to have a, a part of clean tech under us. So we're basically going to be the, uh, the funding model or the, the program uh, provider of, of clean tech. So we've been working uh, with the, uh, uh, the Minister of Environment and his team uh, on what this could look like. Uh, so it's still in the, the stages uh, of work right now, but uh, we will be a funding partner through innovation. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Um, one of the other questions I had about the strategic priorities is it, a gap that seems, you know, has been brought to my attention by a few um, people and businesses now who are, are looking to invest in what's referred to as the circular economy. So, um, you know, an economy in which resources and products are, are kept in use for as long as possible. So the, you know, repurpose, reuse, reinvent, and there's like a, all kinds of really innovative ideas out there that, that people would like to see in pretty much all different areas, any, like, things that I would never have imagined. Um, but they've, I've, I've heard that businesses that are seeking to invest in this type of business are finding it difficult to figure out where they fit in with innovation PEI programs and access funding. That's a that's a good point. Um, so I've never heard that, but I, I do know that we've uh, we've had uh, 
Uh, a few definitely uh, circular businesses that express interest in PEI. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard that there's not a path forward for them. Uh, if there is, uh, we need to correct that. There, there's no doubt about it because uh, it's, uh, it's a thing of the future for sure. Um, so let me go back and check with Innovation PEI because if we don't have a fit for them, we need to find a fit. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Um, all right, and uh, let's see. I think that's it for now. Shall the section carry? Carry. Culture Development and Growth Fund, appropriation product for the Cultural Development and Growth Fund, equipment 700, material supplies and services 1,900, professional services 10,000, salaries 495,000, travel and training 11,800, grants 3,642,100, total Culture Development and Growth Fund 4,161,500. Charlotte Ann Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Cultural Action Plan was actually came out under the previous administration. I know your administration adopted and has done a lot of work in actually fulfilling a lot of the commitments that are made in that with sort of funding and, and direction. Could you speak to um, where you're at with the progress? Because it was a five-year plan. Are we at the point now where we're kind of getting ready for a new one, or you know, what, what what kind of stage are we at with that plan? Yeah, I think we're starting to get ready for a new one. Um, obviously, there's. Uh, um, there's more I think we need to be involved in. Uh, we've certainly seen uh, a lot of good things happen here in PEI. I'll be honest, the culture aspect uh, of this division has probably been the one that's been most eye-opening to me is uh, how much it does for the economy. Um, I've, I'm really focused on seeing it grow. Um, so yeah, I, I would say that uh, we need to, to, to expand that out further and uh, possibly uh, look at what else we can do to, uh, to help uh, on this culture side of it as well. But there's a lot of good things happening. Mm -hmm. but I'm convinced we can do a lot more as well. Charlotte Ann Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, one of those, there were, I mean, I know things change over time, and part of it has been, learned, like you said, that learning curve. So some of the original um, recommendations or kind of action items were, were quite significant around structure, and one of them was um, there was a creative industry secretariat. Um, and a creative industry market development program. Are those things that are still, do you think, on the radar, or has there been a shift in, in direction? No, I certainly think they're still still on the radar. Uh, one thing I find is the department, we, we've got some real strong people in this department uh, that are very passionate about their job, and uh, I'll be honest, they hold my feet to the fire as well. When they want something done, they, uh, they're they not scared to pick up the phone and say, listen, we need to be looking at this. So, um, so yeah, no, certainly I, I think you're going to see, see that expand. There's a lot of great initiatives initiatives in, in the works right now, so uh, this is something I, I'm quite confident that uh, is going to escalate over the years. Charlotte Ann Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. One of the pieces we just heard previously from my colleague from, uh, from Time Valley talking about, you know, clean sec the clean tech as a sector being added as a strategic sector. We also had cultural industries added as, as, a, as a strategic sector, which was what one of the things that helped kind of bring mm -hmm. that into um, a space where that kind of investment and so on could be made. Um, you know what? How how would that reflect? As it you know, with creative industries as a strategic said, how would that reflect in terms of you're talking about it having more weight and, and having more more kind of connection, I guess, rather than being happening over there. Yeah, I, I think the biggest challenge uh, that I've seen in, in in government is is to make everybody aware of of just how strong <coughs> the culture side is for the economy, and that's been my biggest challenge is getting everybody to look through a different lens. Mm -hmm. I really find that we are we're getting there. Um, you look not only the festivals and events, but uh, but you look Phil and PEI, all the great things they've done. What, what we're looking on the film industry here uh, in Prince Edward Island. Um, we've got so much talent uh, on the music side uh, that travel the world, travel the globe that uh, we probably take for granted. And when they're in these places, they promote PEI. Um, so I, I think it's it's finally getting the attention it deserves, and uh, the the big thing is now is is what we're working on. I, I say to the department, we need to succeed because it's a whole lot easier going uh, come budget time looking for money when you can prove that uh, this is an industry that works and is viable. So that's our, our challenge now is just to make sure we have all the sports out there that can focus on this industry, and uh, I'm quite confident there's going to be more money in the future for them. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you. Um, and you know, I know you spoke about like the really strong advocates you have in within the department, and part of that is, um, you know, this industry has been around. It's a huge part of who we are as our cultural this cultural identity. But a lot of it has been, like you said, like a poor cousin almost. And so, yeah. so having those strong advocates who can sort of make those connections, but also, um, 
you know, like you said, recognizing how um, the, the people in the industries that are one that know what they need as well. I know that's been one of the successes of working with film, with film PEIs. They were able to tell you what they actually needed to help and, and recognize that's not something that's going to happen overnight. It's like right. investment now that happens with an outcome three or four years later. And we are seeing that. Small Fortune is an incredible example of that, right? That it's yep. that's years and years of work to get to that. Um, and so, you know, I, you know, I know that that can often be a challenge for government of looking at that kind of really long-term investment, long-term return. Um, and so the commitment to sort of say we're, we're going with the next iteration of a five-year plan I think is really important Definitely. Um, to, to sort of give confidence to the industry that, that you're not going to leave them again, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, the other needs assessments, I mean, I know there's the, you know, COVID has, has rattled this industry, you know, to its bones and, and there are, this yep. is, you know, it's what everyone has struggles, but this has been such a, a direct impact. Has there been kind of a, or is there a new kind of needs assessment in terms of how things need to pivot and change because of COVID? Well, I can, I can tell you one thing that I'm, I'm constantly asking uh, to, to the department staff down there is, you know, where is industry at? How are they doing? Are we missing any gaps? And I'm quite confident that the relationship that the staff have down there uh, with uh, everyone involved in the culture sector is is relatively strong. Um, and I'm going to continue asking that because I want to make sure that we're not leaving anybody behind. I found a lot of programs, small programs, were made, able to make big impacts on some of the lives of these people over COVID. And let's face it, they were hit hard over the last two years. It was, uh, they were right there in what the tourism sector is the hardest hit uh, industry. So um, like I say, I think the department's got a good handle working through that. And, uh, and I hope that they're going to continue. And if there's any gaps, I'm going to do my best, best to fill them. Charlotte on Belvedere. Thank you. I appreciate that. I think that's another really important piece is that it doesn't require a huge investment to make a huge difference. Like we know that with the even with the um, the arts grants, you yeah. know that, that you're administering now. You know we know that, that can be a turning point for for artists to sort of say like a five thousand dollar grant could be the difference in them getting a project off the ground. I know Small Fortune again was one of those examples that began initially with a very small and then was able to snowball out and, and especially arts grants, um, you need to sort of have proof of concept to get to the next stage, to get to counter council or whatever. So those kind of, again, long-term investments really do pay off. Yeah. Um, what kind of coordination is there with, with, with industry partners sort of in terms of education, for example? Like I'm thinking, you know, you've got things like STEAM PEI or you've got the high school programs with arts and music and theater to, to kind of keep people coming through into the cultural industry? So there wouldn't be as much under innovation as skills. Skills, okay. uh, PEI have really focused on, on that as well. So we've been able to uh, uh, utilize a lot of the programs through skills to, uh, to help with some of that, uh, which I find that uh, skills and innovation PEI uh, have worked real well since I've come in, especially on, on this file as well. Because a lot of the projects that, uh, that uh, we're, we're doing, uh, innovation and skills both have a part in it. So it's to keep uh, a good relationship going within departments to, to get these projects off the ground. So most of that would be out of skills, but there's definitely constant communication from innovation there. Cheryl Town Belvedere. Thank you. And I guess you know, and I will come back to it when we get to skills, but one of the one of the challenges in the past for arts um, artists and artists uh, is that because they don't have a traditional work experience that it can be very difficult for them to qualify for programs, especially programs which require EI eligibility or some right. demonstration, you know, you're looking at gig work or patchwork or commission, and it doesn't align with what we consider traditional work. Yeah. Um, has there been any further discussion about, about how to better support artists to be able to make a living? The challenge we're having on a lot of these programs, and, and I'm not picking on the federal government anyway because they've been absolutely great to deal with, right? But uh, there's small gaps that maybe not affect every other province in Canada, but PEI is a little different, right? You know, we've got a seasonal population. Uh, we've got a significant amount of sole propri pro proprietors here in PEI. Um, so what we're trying to do is, is be able to have a little bit of flexibility in some of these programs. Um, uh, with the federal government to allow us to, to, to do this. Um, it's a work in progress, I'll be honest, uh, but at least the communication is happening. And uh, so far, they've been relatively good to deal with on a lot of that stuff. So hopefully, uh, it will continue. Charlotte Helm Belvedere. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, just two bits to it. One of them is a pitch that if there's ever a, a, a group for piloting a basic income other than people with disabilities, it's people from the arts and cultural sector as a primary. And we do have an example of a program that has been administered through skills with the business startup program where people were able to continue to claim EI right. over a year while whilst getting their business set up. So we do have um, examples, you know, and we obviously have context that says that that is a, a, a space that uh, yeah. that can benefit from both of those approaches. Um, but it would be one that, that um, I would really strongly kind of fight for again. I have as I have before <laughs> to say, you know, that there is as much value in investing in somebody from the arts and cultural sector as as an entrepreneur, yeah. um, though they may not fit the, the mold of, you know, a startup that we traditionally see, I think, and I've worked on that in the past with you know, Culture PEI and with the Hive program. Mm -hmm. You have the theater mentorship program is another great example mm -hmm. of being able to sort of leverage the rules into creating a space that otherwise wouldn't exist. And that apprenticeship mentorship is a really great example of how we can build skill set, build, a, build a, the program, but also kind of help people build ties to staying here. Definitely. You know, we don't, but our biggest challenge is that we, that with our youth and people coming into the cult, arts and culture, if you don't have a regular income, you can't live here. No, no, you're absolutely right, and that is one uh, that we've talked about, uh, obviously, because the federal government works uh, on the EI side of it. But um, we would love to see a little bit of leeway because we want to pass forward for for people to to make a, a livable wage, right? And and uh, we don't want, or I don't want to see people being punished for going to work, and that's exactly how REI is structured right now, right? So uh, um, I don't, I'll be honest, it's not going to happen overnight, but uh, I would love to see the federal government work with us on exactly something like that, because I think there would definitely be an appetite on our end for it. Cheryl Tom Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. And I think it's, again, it's one of those lessons, if we've learned anything from COVID, it's how do we cushion people from, from those economic shocks? And, you know, and this is a sector that, that frankly, we could lose. Definitely. You know, if we if we don't sort of like we have we have yep. already lost people from it, and we and we will continue to, and it's so like and it, when it's such a critical piece of our identity as a as a destination, um, we can't afford to do that in the no. same way we can't afford to lose farms or fishing or anything else, right? It's a um, one of the other key things that I know has been really successful for developing new business lines has been trade missions mm -hmm. and export, and I know we have a lot of artists who have themselves. I'm thinking of Irish, who's in. Yeah. Probably in Australia again at the moment, but um, but how, how is that area kind of considered when we look at the cultural sector in terms of expanding and thinking of it again as an exportable product and, and um, working with partners to make that happen? Yeah, so I can't give a lot of details because we're working on something right now that would uh, be exactly what, what you're talking about. Uh, but we want to make sure that uh, for all our artists or anybody that travels the globe and is promoting PEI, it's only helping us, right? And we want to make sure we, we help them the best we can. Uh, I don't have anything finalized yet, but I can tell you there's some discussions in place right now of what we can do uh, to help support uh, those industries uh, while they're traveling. And it's only going to benefit us uh, as well as them. So uh, once I, I get a little closer to some details, I'll be able to tell you, but I'm just not ready to announce anything. Charlotte Town Belvedere. That's okay. We like announceables if they're good news. So it's a. Um, you know, one of the other pieces that has been around how important those cultural sector organizations, industry associations have been. Sometimes they've been the only thing that's helped keep things going. Mm -hmm. It's like your music PEI, film PEI, even when they had no, you know, yep. maybe not the same kind of support that they have at the moment. Um, what are you doing to support them in their mandate to then be that link into the community? So the biggest issue I heard since I come in was the core funding side of it. So surprise. Uh, yeah. So every year, and no different right now, everybody's waiting on a yeah. budget before they get money, right? So I said the very first thing we need to do is give them core funding, three years out, five years out, whatever it is, that's going to give them some security and peace of mind, knowing that they can plan year after year. So that's exactly what we've done. Any any organization through my shop that has come that has asked for long term funding, uh, we we've been able to do it. So that's been a, a big help in our. And Cheryl without That's for that. You know how I feel about core funding. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not, to be honest, a lot of these organizations, these are not new. They've no. been around for years. They have demonstrated right. capacity. They have demonstrated expertise. They've got their financial statements in order. You know, and if they haven't, then you've got mechanisms to work on that. Right. Yep. But um, I, I can't say enough about how important that is for those organizations to be able to do things like strategic planning, or developing training programs, or plan. Yep. You know, for 2025 or whatever. And I'll, I'll be honest, it was a very simple thing. It is. Right? It, it was. Yeah. 
uh, when I asked why can't we do it, the answer was you can do it. Yeah. So it was just like that, right? Charlottetown Belvedere. One of the things that's often raised as to why we can't is um, accountability. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and we have had obviously had examples of organisations that haven't done a good job, and, and there yeah. has been there have been consequences. Um, so what 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 are there are there any other levels of accountability that you're going to be requiring, or is that going to be managed through your your um, your De department? Definitely. So that was kind of one thing we had said is I've got no problem in all the organizations that I've met with personally, I've got no problem going to, but there's got to be some accountability and you've got to be able to t do what you tell me you're going to be able to do, yeah. right? Uh, which I think is a fair, fair trade off, right? Because we want to see success, but at the same time, at the end of the day, every year when you go for a budget, you need to show Department of Finance that there has been success with, with doing it this way, right? So it was almost uh, not only a challenge to me, but it was a challenge to these organizations as well to work together because when we see the su success and we see good results come out of it, it's a whole lot easier for me to go fight at the table when we see the outcomes, right? So, so far, knock on wood, it's been working, but uh, we're, we're early on into it, so. Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, and I think, you know, when I think about how important it is that the cultural sector is sitting in, a, in, in a, as a strategic sector at the same level as, you know, aerospace or biotech, you know, it's it, it, at that bar, um, it does change the, the conversation around trust, you know, in the community and, and the value that's placed on that in the community. Um, and having that dedicated team, you know, who are champions for the organization and therefore bring you on board with that is, is really is really a key piece. My last question on this bit before I give it over to someone else, um, my computer has given up the ghost, um, is um, just around the, um, um, the funding, like the funding arrangements that you have, something like Film PEI, where there are, um, you know, quite complex, where so you've got sort of labor rebates, you've got yeah. investment, and then you've also got sort of partnerships, you know, that are interprovincial or jurisdictional. And are there any challenges that come from that sort of in relationships with other jurisdictions or do they have to be reassessed like on a regular basis or is that um uh, i think you always have to reassess but i i'll be honest i don't know what it was like before uh, there but, wasn't one right so <laughs> so what i find like a lot of that would fall under you know it would be under innovation it possibly could be under finance pei or it could be under skills pei uh tourism has, has a part to do with it too so uh i find you know there's constant communication uh, you might have uh, Phil and PEI working with innovation one day, but they could be working with skills PEI on, on another day, right? So I think the big thing is just to keep the, the communication going. And I I just tell the, tell the staff, like, unless there's a reason why we absolutely can't do this, let's figure a way to do it, right? And and uh, it's it's worked well. I've got a great group of people, uh, CEOs and directors, and uh, and I can say they, they always go above and beyond to try and help everybody out. Sorry, Chair, Charlottetown Belvedere. Yeah, thank you. Um, the other one was around um, the commitment to. Oh, thank you. <laughs> now I've got a computer. Um, the commitment to to ensure that island content was being used for government of PEI um, media, um, because r remarkably, it all wasn't always. I know I have definitely seen seen that, but is there a, like a target that you've set for that to be used or? No, whether it's photography or music or whatever. I haven't set a set a target more. Just pushed uh, pushed the department to, to do so. So we wouldn't have. I could get a, some stats. Probably somebody would have that stats. I wouldn't have it here. But um, but yeah, there there's definitely a push to, to do so. Charlottetown Belvedere. No, I'm I'm good for the moment. I think. Charlottetown West Royalty. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, my first question is just just for a constituent. Yep. Um, and, and she brings up a good a good point. I might just, it's small, I might Definitely. just read it yep. to you. Read it. So I just, uh, uh, so she, <clears throat> she wrote me and she said, I would love for our government to work with Nova Scotia so they are willing to hire PEI talent actors. As it stands, my daughter has missed out on many projects because production gets tax credits for hiring Nova Scotia talent. Uh, we are so close and I feel it would open, if it was open to the maritime actors, it, um, if our province was willing to provide the same tax credit as Nova Scotia. So we're talking about film, PEI, we're talking about hard-working island actors, potentially young actors, yep. um, and Nova Scotia has better deals. They're hiring Nova Scotia talent. What, 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 what should I say to her, and what would so you say? So truthfully, we come out, uh, I'm going to say six months ago, uh, our tax credit is actually higher than Nova Scotia. So that was originally that, uh, but we're actually ahead of Nova Scotia right now. 
uh, for that. So our incentives are significantly higher right now in, in doing that. Not only are we attracting talent back, but we're uh, attracting some big name productions coming to PEI because of that change. Okay. Charlotte Town West Royalty? So then so then what, what is what she having trouble with is there there's just not the production so exactly so how how a lot of these staff uh, work so they they're not necessarily associated with one production they might work with four or five different productions in a run of a year so the productions all along have been in nova scotia rural ontario toronto where we haven't had them in pei so now we're attracting some back to pei which uh, it's too early for me to say, yeah. but there, there is going to be some. And by doing that, this talent is going to come because we have approximately 150 Islanders uh, on PEI that are working elsewhere because there's no work here for them. So by bringing back this tax credit and bringing back an industry, we're going to be able to attract them on repair. Charlotte, how much royalty? Are we doing enough to promote that? Are we are we there? Are we to promote it both like so everybody everybody knows? I guess I'm just like, yep. do we... How do we how do we speed this up? Because we've come we've come with such a significant increase that we're we're getting calls at Los Angeles, rural Ontario, Toronto, uh, the U.S. have called, uh, and this is what we had to do. I, I said we couldn't just be comparable to Nova Scotia because nobody's going to leave an industry that's already there. We need to incentivize. Uh, it took some time to make sure that it was financially doable and to make sure the return was there. There was months of work put into it, but yeah, no, it's uh, it's going in the right direction. And I'm looking forward to the next couple of months because it's uh, going to be some big things happen. Cheryl, how much royalty? Well, I'm glad to hear that, and I can't wait to talk to my constituent uh, about that. And uh, great. Um, so, it, in this section, <clears throat> you see uh, um, salaries are at, at four four ninety five um, last year. Four ninety. Is there any positions associated with that increase? Or yeah. So, so we had a vacancy during twenty one twenty two. Um, you'll see that the budget's there at 486.5, um, but there was a vacant uh, manager of cultural affairs position, um, so we just didn't spend that money and the expectation is they'd be hired next year. Sure, all time, what's royalty? So they're going to be hired, there's nobody, there's still, that position's still vacant? Correct. Okay. Sure, all time, what's royalty? Um, so the grants, I just want to maybe talk about some, some grants around, um, the, the first two, I think we've talked about it, uh, if we look at the Black Cultural Society of Prince Edward Island, $96,000, that's their, that's their operating? So they're part of their um, operating? Yeah, so there's two different pieces. There is one that was under economic and population growth, and I think, I think there's something in the handouts there about the details, but some are project-based as well. Okay. Um, so some would come out of here that it could be project-based, whereas the other could be operational. Okay. Charlotte, how much royalty? Is the BOG project funding there? Uh, yes, I don't know if it's in here or not, but it is. It is available. Uh, I'm not sure where. Yeah, I'm not sure whether it lies here or in the other division that already went through, but it is covered. Cheryl, how much royalty? And I guess I'll ask about that. Is that I, I, I get stuck between a government has done. You've done a good job, Minister, of giving out money. Yep. But we're stuck between what you give out and the capabilities, the HR capabilities of the organizations that you give. It Agree, hundred percent. Um, so how do we bridge, how do you and I and whatever yep. right now, how do we bridge that gap so that you're, you're giving the organizations the respect they need, but like in a project like the BOG project, yep. if, we, if, we, if we go to an election sometime in the fall of next year and that project isn't started, yep. it's, it's like... So I agree 100%. So two things I've done, I've asked the department where we're at in this, but also when Tamara was in a, a couple of weeks ago, I went over and asked her personally, do you need more resources? Because we're quite prepared to fund resources to get these projects off, off the ground. So um, that's not an issue. And I said to Tamara, you reach out. If you feel you need more resources to help, let me know and we will make sure we get some resources for you. Cheryl, how much royalty? So yeah, and I, I know she's she's had a few resources because that that first year yep. w we almost lost an executive director because of how big a busy she was. It's not your fault. It's not anybody's fault. It's just that they're trying to take on right. too much. Um, so funding's coming in from areas and, and different different areas. So talking about talking about the the micro grants, the micro loan program from last year. You know I'm going to ask you about it. Yep. Um, wh where where is the funding here? How much is it for? Um, and when, just give me some details on that. 
I'm going to have to get back to you with all the details because it's been uh, it's probably been a month or two since I've it's probably been a couple months since I since I had an update. Um, so I don't have the final number. From my understanding, um, I believe my deputy minister and Tamara have met exactly on uh, on this uh, program on and kind of how it would look because uh, we want to make sure that the Black Culture Society. Uh, decides, I guess, where this grant money goes. We want to make sure the focus is, is going into the hands of, uh, of the right people. So we're going to be a financial provider on it. Uh, so I don't know if all the details have been finalized, but uh, they might be, and I'm just not aware of it. So I'll bring that back first thing tomorrow with an update of, of where that's at and what kind of dollars are in, in the pool for that. Charlton, what's royalty? Okay, and, okay, great. And maybe some, maybe a couple things. Now, this is a great department. I know a lot of people who work there. They do a lot of good work. Yep. I'm, just, I'm just saying is that help help on the government side to speed it up with some various paperwork. And then, and I mean, I've talked to Tamara about this too. And, yep. but, but my job is to keep you accountable. No, 100%. Yeah. And, and I don't... I don't think it's it's anybody not doing their job on this one. I, I think, I think the big thing is there's just so much happening on, with the Black Culture uh, Society and the community. They've done so much in a, in a course of a year and a half, um, and maybe it's as simple as resources. And if it is, I'm quite committed to, to working uh, with the organization as well. So, I'll uh, I'll get an update just to sure. see where the projects are at and what we need to do to, to speed the process up. Charlottetown, what's royalty? And, uh, we we uh, unanimously voted for an Emancipation Day legislation, and uh, Mr. Can we can we expect to see some funding in this section? I know we can't see it in here, but can we expect to see some funding maybe for this year out of out of this area or culture? That probably wouldn't come out of this. I don't know where that would come out, but I don't think it would come out of yeah. Charlton, what's I'll have to get back to you on that one. There would be some funding. I just don't know where it's coming out of. Yeah, is it going to be the premiers or, or maybe? Yeah, we'll bring it back to you. And I know that your staff is probably watching, so I'd like okay. to, I'd like to see about um, where that's where that's going to go. Um, it, is there any? Is is this section have anything to do with the the startup zone at all? Uh, no. No. Okay. Just, Charlton, what's royalty? Okay, and um, the. Uh, in halfway down the first page in the in the budget line, there's uh, innovation PEI cultural development, seventy-five thousand dollars. Innovation PEI cultural development, fifty thousand. Um, do you know what those are? Is this in the handout? Yeah, it's in the big big book. I can get further details for you on what exactly those were for. Okay. And bring those back. Charlotte, what's royalty? And maybe I'd like to just to the it's in my district, the Benevolent Irish Society. So they got a little bit of funding there. So mm -hmm. I just want to uh, see what that grant money was for. Okay. And uh, I'll, okay. I'll pass the floor at this time. Thanks, Chair. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Um, thank you, Chair. Just one quick question. So there's, you know, all kinds of fantastic um, organizations and initiatives that have been funded, um, you know, that you have outlined in, in, the, uh, in the handout book here. Um, how many applications are rejected or have, were rejected last year? None that I'm aware of. None? Unless it's a specific project that may not meet the, the criteria of some, but let me get back to you on, on that. But there's none that I'm aware of at this okay. point. Time Valley that's, Sherbrooke. That's it for the section. Thank Shall the section carry? Okay. Global trade services appropriations provided for development of trade and export opportunities for island businesses and salaries, 604,200. Travel and training, 52,000. Total global trade services, 656,200. Time Valley Sherbrooke. So, can you tell me a little bit about what are our targets for global trade? What are we, what are we shooting for here? What are we, yeah. As far as industry goes, or dollar wise, or, or well, I guess both. You know, what are the what are the outcomes that you're working toward? Yeah. So, one thing that this this side of the department um, we do we do a lot of trade in through uh, eastern U.S. So you have uh, fishing, you have potatoes, uh, aerospace, uh, airplane parts is, a, is another huge. Um, so we see a lot uh, through this uh, department uh, in through uh, eastern New England states and, and so forth, uh, as well as uh, certain 
countries as well. So uh, we've seen a, a big uptake on some of the seafood, for example, through uh, Japan um, and uh, I believe maybe Italy, but don't quote me on that. There's a couple new target markets that ha have come to light. Uh, so that's what this side uh, wor works on. Um, we don't have real accurate numbers when you, when you come into the export side of it. Um, because a lot of it travels through Halifax and the containers through Nova Scotia, so they kind of get credit for some of the numbers that we, we don't get credit for, uh, which is kind of a, I've asked how we can, you know, get more concrete, uh, but there's, there's just no way, because once they leave here, they go by truck, and a lot of times they hit uh, a, a ship in Halifax and, and move on. So that's kind of the, the, the one part that I find it doesn't, give us accurate numbers on our export side of it. Okay. Um, but I know they're constantly working on new markets. I know the Minister of Fisheries, uh, I forget which, which country it was the other day, but uh, they've just hit, uh, PEI's just hit a, a big market uh, on oysters. Um, and, and right now we can't, uh, we can't grow enough oysters. Uh, uh, there was a time there was too much, now there's not enough. So by, by uh, this department and I know uh, uh, fisheries and communities as well as agriculture, we've, uh, we've been able to uh, make a lot of headway here. Hi, Valley Sherbrooke. Yeah, well, that's that's all really great to hear. And I wonder about, you know, you, you mentioned the uh, increased market for oysters. So oysters. So is that, you know, cultured oysters as well as the um, wild oyster fishery? Or is that like... It is that cultured oysters. Like? I'm not sure on the okay. wild fishery side of it. I know the cultured oysters, uh, after talking to uh, a few of the processors, uh, uh, there's a big concern that uh, they don't have enough product right now. So it was complete opposite pre-COVID, if you remember. Uh, and when COVID hit, uh, we had too much product, and now we're running out of, out of product, right? So, um, so it, it's going to be a, a challenge. It's, it's that industry alone is a, a product of their own success, in a, in a sense. So uh, there's definitely could be some challenges on, on filling some of the markets. But, uh, but I know that when the Minister of Fisheries gets to the floor, he, uh, he's got a good handle on where those markets are at, and uh, he'll be able to provide a little more detail. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay, yeah, and uh, I think we already had the Minister of Fisheries, I think, to the floor, but oh, it was doing? a great okay. conversation, too. I'm okay. enjoyed talking about that. Yeah, he um, come back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he would. I'm sure he would, yes. Um, <laughs> so I'm wondering then, um, you know, you mentioned, you know, COVID, uh, sort of in terms of, of that uh, one industry, but, you know, what uh, impacts has COVID had on trade for PEI overall? Well, aerospace would have been the, big, the biggest one because. Right. Uh, a large portion of airplane parts in North America uh, comes out of front of Park. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, COVID really slow, slowed that down. We've seen some layoffs there, but we've seen uh, the aerospace industry rebound uh, back. Uh, they're, they're, they're starting to rehire again uh, and uh, looking to expand. So I think we're on our way out of, out of COVID now that the airplanes are, are going again. But that was probably one that was, that was hit one of the hardest, and obviously as well as our, our potato industry right now. Uh, which I spent yesterday in the district uh, touring potato farms, and I'm, I'm telling you the, the concern that they have right now and, and what they're dealing with, even though there's some good news coming to light, some of them feel it's, it's too late. Like, I've talked to potato farmers that aren't even sure they're going to be able to put a crop in this year, so it's a pretty sad state of affairs. Yeah. Time Valley Sheriff Book? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a very sad state of affairs for sure. I want to go back to aerospace just for a second, because that's certainly an industry that we know, yes, yes, absolutely was very hard hit during COVID. I mean, you know, quite simply put, people weren't flying. And it's my understanding right. that a lot of the work that happens, um, you know, uh, you know, on the island um, with uh, aerospace is, is on smaller kind of uh, planes. So that, you know, like anyway, there's just, the, it was, it was a, uh, you know, I know they were hard hit. And I know that uh, they did have a lot of, have to let a, let a lot of people go. Um, do you know if, um, uh, you know, th they've been looking at, uh, as they're hiring people back, are they hiring back the same people, do you know, or is it new workers? Like, what is, what, how is that going? Truthfully, that I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. I think the last number I heard, they're hiring back 35, but I don't know if they're new workers or, or workers that were there previous. In my understanding, there's, a, there's a, another uh, uh, they're going to expand and they're going to need some more as well over the coming year, but I, I wouldn't have that information. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Um, and do you see any of the impacts that have, have occurred as a result of COVID continuing into this fiscal year? Or do you expect them to you know, continue to improve at this point? No, I think they're going to continue to improve. You, you never know what's going to take place, but uh, as of right now, it looks like optimism's high and, uh, and everything's uh, getting back uh, pre-COVID, so hopefully that's what this year is going to be. Hi, Valley Sherbrooke. Uh, that's it for this section. Still a section, Kerry. Kerry.
Business Development and Innovation Appropriations provided for delivery of information assistance to businesses in Prince Edward Island. Salaries one million three hundred nine thousand four hundred. Travel and training sixty thousand. Total Business Development and Innovation one million three hundred sixty nine thousand four hundred. Shall the section carry? Shall this section carry? carry. Programs appropriations provided for development of business. PI tax incentives twenty two million nine hundred fifty thousand. Business expansion and product development, 23,010,300. Trade and export development, 750,000. Total programs, 46,710,300. Time Valley Sherbrooke. All right, so, so question around labor rebates. So it just, when I was looking at the annual report, which is, is, which is 2020, 2021, um, I noticed on uh, page 13 here, um, it talks about uh, disbursement of uh, development program expenses at you know twenty nine million five hundred seventy seven thousand mm -hmm. uh, for labor rebate assistance, and then here in 2021-2022, which I realize is a year later, but that in the book it looks it's it's more like twenty million. Um, so I just it just seems like a big discrepancy, and I'm just wondering like how what am I missing here? Are those the same programs? Are you comparing? I I don't have the idea report in front of me, so I'm just okay. wondering if they're comparing. When we look at the tax incentive line uh -huh. um, in the budget book, it encompasses PEI labor rebates, uh -huh. but also um, the aerospace rebates or, or tax incentives and the bioscience tax incentives. So there's a number of different line items that make up that total number. Yeah. I'm Alex Sherbrooke. The yeah, only thing you. I can think, uh, honorable member, is when COVID hit, so then tax credits go with an individual. So if that individual wasn't hired on, uh, that tax credit wouldn't go. So we would have had it budgeted. But with COVID, a lot of hires didn't happen that we're supposed to hire. So that could be the difference. But okay. we can confirm that. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Yeah, I mean, you know, and that that could make sense. I was just trying to understand it because yes, it does. There's there's a lot more included in here, but this number is much bigger. What in the report? Yeah. So I just was trying to understand what I was not. Yeah, and the other is trying to understand it. Yeah, the other piece of that is with the PEI labor rebates. It could it could be a listing of here is what was approved during the year, but if we don't actually pay them out, so if the company didn't meet the criteria in a year or create the number of jobs that they were supposed to, we would only expense what they were entitled to, okay. and that's what you would have in your handouts. I'm Valley Sherbrooke. Okay. Um, and it, are there any you know? Um, like consequences or anything for a, a company that had committed to, you know, uh, to securing a certain number of jobs uh, and uh, and just not following through for whatever reason. Like, how does that work? Yeah, they wouldn't get the rebate. They so just don't get. They it just then. don't get okay. get the rebate. Now we don't we don't pay the rebate until after, um, after the the person has worked. Time Valley Sherbrooke. So, what proportion of the companies that you attract to the province uh, receive, you know, uh, financial incentives sort of through some of these like labor rebate programs? I would have to get an exact number, but a majority of the companies coming in uh, would would get a labor rebate, uh, depending on uh, the type of job and depending on on the income level, right? So, uh, mm -hmm. for example, we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't uh, give incentives on the labor side for 50 people coming in with minimum wage jobs. We wouldn't reward that company for doing that. So, it's a it's a reward to help out uh, good paying jobs on, on PEI. But I'll get you an exact number of percentage what what we would do. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and again, it is it is certainly good to hear that they're you're not looking at uh, rewarding uh, you know companies that are br come bringing in minimum wage jobs that you're looking for, for good jobs for Islanders. So uh, yeah. I'm again looking for more information on that for sure. Um, you are budgeting to spend 3.5 million more on tax incentives this fiscal year. Uh, that's what it looks like. So what tax incentives are being provided and to whom? So are you looking at the what makes up the increase? The, uh, well, okay, yes, sorry, we'll start there. What, why, why that increase? So um, there's an extra 500,000. Um, yep. Okay, okay. There's an extra 500,000 related to the BioVector expansion mm -hmm. in PI labor rebate. Okay. Um, there's another two and a half million for bioscience. 
um, and another 500,000 for advanced marine. And with respect to the last two, we're, we had decreased that line item um, in last year and we're just bringing it back to normal levels because that's the expectation of the companies that have those contracts. I'm Valley Sherbrooke. Okay, and so were there areas then, or, or I should say, are there companies where the tax incentives have decreased then this, this fiscal year? You just listed some er or um, areas where it was increasing. So are you seeing decreases as well? I think we're actually on, on our projectile forward where, where we're seeing them come back to normal levels. So. Okay. I'm Valley Sherbrooke. So, and how do you assess whether these tax incentives are um, achieving the, the outcomes that you're hoping that they will achieve? Well, there's criteria, I guess, put, put in place of uh, the type of company, uh, the wage uh, of what a salary would make, uh, and the success of, of it, right? So we've seen, um, you know, some, some great companies on PEI over the last 20 years that I guess we could debate in a sense whether they deserve um, deserve funding on some of the side, but let, let's use uh, the aerospace sector. Like if it wasn't for that aerospace, there's approximately 400, 450 good paying jobs that come out of that, that one company. Mm -hmm. And even today, we're still willing, as long as they're hiring new people for, for good salaries, we're, we're more than happy to, 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 to help with some of the programming on it. Um, I don't have any of the stats of the companies that have left or or any of that correct, but I can go back and, and see. Uh, there's none that I'm aware of, but I'm not saying saying there isn't, but I, I can double check. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay, yeah, thank you. And just go, going back to the uh, to Standard Aero again in the aerospace industry, um, you know, uh, it would be very, you know, I think it would be worth asking, you know, as we're continuing the labor rebates in this really important industry, you know, I know that um, a lot of work was done to support uh, islanders who had lost their jobs in, in that industry. And, and yep. um, you know, I'm just, I want to make sure that those people had the opportunity to go back now that it is expanding back again. Um, I don't know if that's the case, but I think it's really important because they're, you know, those are people who have committed, you know, to that industry and have trained already. And, you know, just, I, I just want to yeah, check that. in on that. Uh, so if, if you had any information on that, you could bring back or if, if that's something you well, might that, that wouldn't, I guess, necessarily, I can't control, government can't control if that company was to take these people back, because there could be reasons why some of these people aren't, aren't going back. Uh, but what I can say, what we did do, because my big concern is when those people were laid off, we wanted to make sure they uh, they found work. So uh, we had the team reached out to uh, to the company that uh, that provided uh, all the employees that were let go, that uh, if, if anybody is looking for work or you need any help, contact Innovation PEI. We had somebody work uh, with all them employees to, to find uh, alternate jobs as well. And uh, from my understanding, for the most part, uh, that I know of, everybody either found a job on their own or, or we were able to help them out. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Okay, yeah, no, and I do I do remember that um, and, and uh, that there was uh, significant efforts made to help those help the, the people who lost their jobs in that industry find new work and um, you know it was a really difficult time for those folks so that's why I bring it up I just think you know yeah. when we um, the labor you know rebates are considerable that that you know are received in that industry and I just want to make sure that the workers are, are taken care of um, and, and definitely that it's a fair process for them so okay um, so the business expansion and product development um, has a 7.4 million dollar budget increase expected uh, can you explain this increase yep. so 3.8 million dollars is anticipated um, with respect to a PEI film media project that the ministers alluded to which we just can't speak of yeah. yet because <laughs> okay. the final details but it's uh, it's going to be a, a great project for PEI if it uh, if it follows through and then there's another 3.6 million dollars expected for the capital expansion project for Biobectra. Mm -hmm. Valley Sherbrooke. Makes sense. And you know, very it's it'll be very interesting to hear about the this film media project. Um, one of the things I'm wondering, and I, I think I, I heard a little bit about this uh, on the news, but you know, uh, uh, the the staff required to do sort of this all of the in, in supporting roles mm -hmm. when we are you know filming on PEI, right? It's often some of the same crossover, same people who would be working in our theater industries as well. So yep. you know, we really need to increase capacity um, in in those uh, areas. So uh, can you tell me a little bit about how that's going and what investments have been made to increase capacity um, yeah. of that workforce? So regardless of if this project, there's there's a bunch more in, in the works now. But what we're trying to do. 
Uh, one is, is, is work with uh, the projects that come in here to help train our islanders that want to get into the workforce. Not only are we trying to attract islanders to come home to the industry, but we want to upskill and, and, and train people that want to get in this now, uh, into this industry. So um, we've got a working group that's been uh, working together, Skills PEI, uh, as well as Innovation Tourism has been on it, Finance PEI, uh, to be able to work towards that. So the departments have been kind of working together on making sure we, we can uh, we can do this so um, it's tough for me to talk about when I can't say too right, much but sorry. there's a lot there's it, it's a good thing that's going to happen and, and I, I really think not only are we going to bring some islanders home but we're going to be able to put uh, some people islanders that are living here right now into an industry and, and grow from there so I'm Valley Sherbrooke so just a, a, a practical question here uh, that there's probably a really clear answer to you, but I just don't know what it is. I noticed that on page uh, 12 to 13 of the handouts, uh, Small Business Support Development Fund, there seem to be several lines for grants provided uh, to various parts of Innovation PEI, um, totaling you know several thousand dollars. Is, is, am I reading that right, that Innovation PEI provides grants to itself? Um. D depending on on what it is, um, sometimes if we have a trade mission, for example, um, we would put it all under in an innovation PEI name, but the grants within that actually go out to companies. But innovation P PEI might be paying for um, booths or, or whatever, or the company comes in on a claim basis. So rather than making, um, it's just where our database system works, I guess, but rather than making, say, 10 or 15 different small ones, then we just put it under one, and then we can measure the cost in totality of that particular trade mission. I'm Valley Sherbrooke. Okay, and how do you decide what is a small amount of money that can just kind of get lumped in with, with other things? And like, where's the line for what needs to be identified directly as a grant to a specific project or company or whatever? Mm -hmm. it, yeah. I would have to go back to staff and ask that actually the program officers. Okay. Yeah. I'm Valley Sherbrooke. That. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I'd be curious to know that for sure. Um, is there anybody else on the list? You're on the list. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Do you have any more questions or? He's got his hand up over there. I don't know. I'm chairing. Oh, okay. sorry. So, <laughs> okay. Are you finished questions? I have some more questions, but I was open to allowing someone else okay. to have space to speak. Okay. Should that be Valerian Burness? Uh, just a couple of questions there. So, business development. What was uh, what's happening with W? A grains at uh, Slemon Park. Is there anything that's going on there? Yeah. Or is it just kind of staying in the area? Yeah. 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 Y
there is some potential for new space next to it, although I understand the whole issues of environmental sensitivities, but is there anything that can be done to try to work with them to try to say what, what can we do to look at the future on that, uh, that other bog? Because uh, I go back to saying it, it's, it has a significant impact on if even just Green Diamond uh, uh, tractor dealership in Bloomfield. It's one of the largest purchasers of John Deere tractors in Canada. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, all the work that goes around that. And uh, like I say, it employs a lot of people. And if they don't have some... Uh, alternatives, you know, in the next few years, because they have to work on getting the new bog ready. And I know they are looking at swapping land as a possibility to uh, give some of the old bog uh, to maybe to the crown and, and let that sort of regenerate back on its own. So so I, I'm going to almost say, Minister, I think somebody's going to have to get involved here to make a decision. Because right. uh, the current decision is we're not, we're, we're just going to let it uh, go out of business. And I just got a big, large number of them workers there in my district. So I'm not privy to that. That wouldn't necessarily fall under me. Um, but what I would suggest is um, between the Minister of Environment and the Minister of Transportation, if there's a land swap, I don't mind at some point going up to your district and you can uh, tour me around so I can visualize what uh, what's going on. Obviously, under my department, I don't want to see any job loss or any business go out. So uh, um, I have no problem going up and uh, you can show me what's going on and I can try and uh, see if we can work through environment transportation to uh, resolve their issues. Well, are you in for us? Yeah, well, I, and I appreciate that. And I, and I have every confidence your department would do what we could in trying to work that out. But, it, you know, when I go back to when I look at the budgets like trade and export development, you get $750,000 allocated. And I'm not asking for all that money or anything, but I'm just trying to say that, uh, well, I'd take it if it was there, I guess. But, but, but they do a lot of export. I mean, they, they export peat moss to, like, Egypt and a number of places throughout the world. I mean, there's, there's tractor trailers that go from my district probably three, four times a day to the seaport in Halifax, it, it, it's pretty significant. And uh, it, uh, you know, that's so why I'm just saying, can we do some either business development, business expansion or product development to try to allow them to uh, do something that makes some sense to create and maintain those jobs? Because there's certainly an expertise in uh, uh, peat moss harvesting there. They do have land next to them, and I understand the complications with land when you try to transfer that, when you go, have to go through mm -hmm. indigenous issues and things of that nature. But it would seem to me that somebody's got to take this bull by the horns and sort of sit down and say, what can we do? Or the decision is that, okay, it, it's, it's, it'll, it'll fait accompli, we, there's nothing more we can do, and then at least they can plan a closer strategy in that uh, place, as painful as that might be to me as an MLA. Mm -hmm. but, mm -hmm. Well, uh, I think we're going to i got to get a an update to see what the challenge is. There's obviously something there that I'm, I'm not aware of, right, of why uh, we're just not in the business to, to seeing a company close down on job losses, right? Yeah. So uh, whether it's an environmental issue, I, I well, don't know, but, but I, I am committed to, to following up and seeing if uh, if anything can be done. Well, Larry and Vernas? Well, just to my understanding, there's two issues, and, and <coughs> one issue is the whole issue of land transfer. I mean, there's there's land that's owned by the province, and it can't easily transfer that land somewhere else. Uh, it can maybe lease it. There may be some possibilities around that. Uh, but it has to go through with the whole indigenous issue to decide whether it can be transferred to someone um, other than the, the, the crown itself. And the other issue is just the, the general environmental sensitivities of, uh, of a peat moss harvest. I mean, it, it, it has its... Uh, uh, concerns. I, I'm not disputing that, but it's been going on there since I'm going to say the late 60s, maybe early 70s. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, I think the community is aware of what, you know, the pros and cons of it. And I think we've, we've uh, looked at the benefits, what it does to the community from a job perspective. So, uh, so it is ultimately those are the two issues. And uh, I get any government's sensitivities in wanting to tackle it. But I, I guess as, a, as an MLA that represents the area knows there's that many jobs there and knows the economic spin-offs of that. Um, like we also have issues around three-phase power in that location for this is another issue that's there too. I mean, we get into talking, and I talked with you before, about generators and things of that mm -hmm. nature. You know, the answer they get back to me, I, it's just not worth the investment to know that we're going to be out of business in a few more years anyway. So yeah, we'd invest in a, in a generator or three-phase power if I knew that there was a future in the bog. So that's, a, that's what I'm getting back from the owners of the bog. And uh, Well, I, I will commit to going and checking to see if anything can be done and get, uh, I guess, a better handle of what's going on with that company. Well, Larry and Renas? 
I guess from my end, I, I'll stop questions, but I appreciate that, Minister. And like I say, I do think it is probably going to be a three a three portfolio issue, like you right. said, transportation, uh, environment, and your department. And uh, um, yeah, we just got to get got to get to the end of the the decision making process here. Otherwise, I'm I'm wasting my time. You're wasting your time. We're all mm -hmm. not going anywhere with it. So okay, appreciate that, Minister. Sure, I'll tell what's wrong with you. Um, so business expansion and product development, when, when you talk about business expansion, I, as we're talking in that, and, and you had two great projects, big projects, huge, um, a, a lot of uh, with BioVectra and mm -hmm. the other one that we can't talk about. So that takes up a lot of budget, um, you know, $7.5 million in budget. I look at that business expansion right now, I might even call that business survival for some. Uh, coming out of COVID and stuff, yep. what what's being done in this line with that money for for the for the little for the little organized for the little businesses trying to survive and trying to cope? So that wouldn't fall under under this section. I believe that would be back. But uh, so this goes back to our uh, our innovation program. So one of the gaps where we were always focused on big business, but we weren't focused on small business. So by revamping those third, I believe there were 31 programs, we were able to change the criteria around to allow small businesses to, to access. Um, now, don't get me wrong, there's still some gaps that we, we have to work through. Uh, you and I worked together on one that I clearly seen there was, there was an issue. Um, so there, there's constant changes going around, but we're trying to change the focus on small business because everybody's got a different interpretation of it. and. Uh, Five ten thousand dollars to a small business uh, could go a long way on not only employing people but uh, making the economy work here. So I want to make sure we don't leave them behind. But the first step was to change those programs around that, that would make them easier to access. Charlotte, West Royalty. That's, that's good. And and so for this line, so then this would basically we were looking at business expansion, bigger business. That's right. that's what that's what we're focusing in here. So so then if you see there was. There's $15 million budgeted. You only spent 12. Was that because of COVID, basically? That would likely be because of COVID, yes. yes. Um, most of these are application-based, so based on what the business is asking for. Um, but any COVID programming um, wouldn't be reflected in this yeah. Yeah. in in this budget. It would be in the Department of Finance. So perhaps a company may have access to uh, <laughs> programming with the COVID funding and not applied for regular funding under here. Charlottetown West Royalty. And and would your would your have COVID funding from the past gone into anything like this, like ex helping businesses expand nothing along those lines? No, that COVID funding would have committed the contingency fund in finance. Yeah. Charlottetown West Royalty? So so then that that three million dollars do as as a as a minister, do you say that and say, hey, okay, you know what, we didn't spend that last year. We're going to try to do more in the future with that money? Obviously you want to get as much money as you, you can through the department. So what we do, we basically put in all our asks and then uh, finance comes back and say, well, this is what we can do. And so, so it's a constant back and forth. Um, like I say, I, I would love to get as much as I can because I'm, I'm a firm believer that in the right places you can do good things with it. But um, so that's that's the biggest challenge, I guess, on the budget side of it is you just don't get what you what, what I ask for, right? So even though we come with our needs, not necessarily we get it all. So, so, West Royal so breaking that down, and when it says product development, um, what, what would that what 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 are you looking at? How does it go, how do you support product development? What's the breakdown between business expansion and product development in that line? Do you have a breakdown of what? I don't have a breakdown. We don't have a breakdown of what that that would look like, but I need a back down, honorable member. Charlottetown West Royalty. So those are businesses that come to you and say, "Hey, um, I've got I've got a new prod. Uh, it's it's." basically like right. Dad? Yeah, so, so you look at BioVector, right? So BioVector grew by over COVID. I'm going to say it's got to be, I, I, I'd be guessing with the numbers. I think they're up $100 million, right? Yeah. Uh, so they've found a market. They've, uh, they've been able to expand. They've had a vision uh, that not only through COVID, but they've got a, a long-term vision that's going to, uh, to expand. 
uh, good paying jobs. So to, that is something we're, we're focused and we see the return, we see the value uh, at the end of the day. They're good paying jobs and that's an industry. Same, same with the uh, fill, fill and PEI, right? We've seen an industry that we just talked about, good paying jobs. The, uh, the lowest wage earner in a film crew is making $1,200 a week and that's the, the low on the high end. It could be uh, five to $8,000 a week. So, so we see that there's a market there and this is what we want to look at uh, focusing on, right? So these are these are kind of different different businesses that one not only are they going to employ people but it's going to be good paying jobs that what uh, that's what we're trying to attract here in PEI. Charlottetown West Royalty. The, the the thanks Minister and the, the trade and export development. Um, you know we there's 259 thousand spent last year. It, the the budget goes up to back up to 750 thousand. Is that yeah. enough? Um, we're coming out of this you know. I'm going to say yes, and the only reason I say that because if it wasn't enough, I would be hearing from my CEOs and directors that that's not enough, yeah. and that has not been brought to, to my attention. So I'm saying it is enough, and at any given time they say, listen, we're low, and that's when it's my job to go back and, and fight for more. Charles, how much royalty? Because I know that line is that we're, we're trying, we, we have to get trade out there. We have to do things in our province to, mm -hmm. to diversify our trade. and. And I know that if those open up, if there's trade missions that open up, and I know before in the past maybe that that that, that little area has been been cut a little bit at different times, but um, are we ready to jump at opportunities if they arise? Definitely, we're we're already at it. So uh, there's been a few companies already that have gone over the last couple of months in some of these trade missions. The Boston Seafood Show yeah. has been one. Uh, just the presence that the island companies got at the Boston Seafood Show, you think a, a small province with 165,000 people to see uh, what we look like in a whole world market on, on that seafood show alone was, was out of this world. So, um, and, and I know there's, there's more coming. So the calendar is out. I don't have a list of how many and what companies are going, but yeah, there's, it's full steam ahead now. Charlton, what's wrong? Last, last question is that we did a, there was a trade mission a few years ago to India. Um, where are you, as Minister, where are you targeting internationally for Prince Edward Island to develop more trade and export to? I will have to get back to you with a list on that. So I don't have a list of the countries we're, we're in now, but I will bring that back. Cheryl Thomas Royalty. Yeah, that's good. Thank you, Chair. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Chair. So uh, the member from O'Leary Inverness asked one uh, finance PEI related question. I have one that there's some there's oh, a connection come back. On. Can you let me have one? <laughs> one we'll see. One. I'll ask and you can decide. Um, so I just uh, it's my understanding that um, uh, finance PEI has very few clients actually when it comes to IT and renewable energy. I think there's like 13 clients in total, if I and less than a million dollars in loans. Um, I'm just wondering, um, you know, why is it such a, a, a low portion of the loan portfolio? The only thing I can guess is there's just not a lot of applications come in. So one thing with finance PEI, uh, it's a very thorough process, business plan. Um, they got to make sure there's value. They, uh, uh, they they put a rating on, a risk rating on it. So the only thing I can think of is there's not many applications because there's no reason why finance wouldn't look at something like that. I'm Valley Sherbrooke. All right, so here's the crossover. So okay. is Innovation PEI doing anything specifically to attract um, uh, more IT and renewable energy companies? Uh, yes, so IT for sure, and the, renewal, the renewable energy side of it, we've been working with uh, the Department of Environment. There is going to be some programming come out. Um, I don't have privy to all the details yet because it's still being worked on, but uh, that's definitely part of this year's plan. Uh, Time Valley Sherbrooke. Thanks. I just have a, a couple of questions about the Rural Broadband Fund. Yep. So first of all, the, the one for businesses. Um, can you uh, um, explain a little bit about, just so I understand the purpose of this program uh, for businesses specifically? So that's not in this section. I think we've already passed it. But oh, uh, did we? Oh, I'm sorry. But it's, it's all right. Um, so what we've done now, uh, leaps and bounds, uh, and I'm sure everybody in this house is getting less calls on bad internet uh, over the last couple of years now. Definitely there's some issues still, uh, but we're working, we're working through it. So there's been a few real good success stories. I'll give you a high level. So uh, all the towers uh, um, from ExploreNet are up and running. FiberOp is being run by ExploreNet now. Uh, Bell uh, is completing their projects uh, with, with fiber alone. Um, a, a 
the saving grace to us has been the Starlink side of it. So we've put in the, the residential as well as the commercial fund that would help anybody that's struggling with internet right now is a, a, a pot to help uh, purchase the equipment, which has been a huge uptake. Uh, I believe we've had to uh, uh, get a little more money put, put into that pot. And uh, it looks like we are going to hit all our targets. Uh, I'm always at the department to make sure that we are hitting our targets. And everything that's being said to me is uh, we're going to be looking at that last uh, last five percent that last mile in the very near future. Time about the Good. So, you know, one of the questions that I did have, though, looking at uh, the breakdown for this fund, is that it looks like um, most of the money under this program um, it it went to Bell Alliant, but you know, it looked like that, and the. the the, the province has a contract with Bell Alliant under the Department of Transportation and Infrastructure already. So yep. does that, it seems a little bit like a conflict. I don't know. No, so these no. were diff different projects. And yeah. there was a lot, I believe there was five or six different internet providers that accessed this money as well. Uh, what we need to do is make sure we're going to hit our targets, right? So at the end of the day, uh, we've got some smaller internet companies that I would think uh, would be very happy with being able to expand. Uh, I know there's a couple uh, providers in, in your district, Honorable Member, and I believe that the leader of third party that have really been able to uh, to help the community out. Uh, one company has uh, has delivered fiber. I believe there's another application coming in from that same company through another stream. So it's to work with all the providers and the areas. We want to make sure we don't overlap any areas, uh, which obviously there's a little bit overlap in certain places just because uh, there's, there's no way around it. But uh, any local company that comes and wants to do a project, as long as it's feasible and going to provide uh, uh, high-speed internet, we're more than happy to look at it. I'm Valley Sherbrooke. And how do you decide when you're funding these projects, you know, where Starlink does fit in here? Because that's obviously not a local company, but certainly it has expanded access yep. uh, in ways that, you know, were just unimaginable a few years ago. So how do you decide when to fund something like a Starlink sort of connection and when to go with a local company? So the mapping shows us now where Bell and ExploreNet and the local ISPs are going and then our last uh, portion of it that, that we're going to need some help and Starlink is going to be able to help some of that. So we can't say every civic address. Uh, we might have a, a road in Morrell that, that 12 homes on it and 10 of them are going to have great internet but there might be two homes that uh, could be trees or a hill or something in the way that we're going to need to, to look at other options and this is where Starlink's going to, going to play but we don't have exactly of, of where them gaps be filled but we know where Bell and Exploring and the other uh, local companies are going so that's helping us out. Time Valley Sherbrooke. And can you give us an update on the contracts with uh, Bell Alliance and ExploreNet and what percentage of the agreements are completed and what's the timeline to finish? I'll have to get back to you with all the exact numbers. Time Valley Sherbrooke. So, um, so in terms of those six to seven percent of households that aren't covered under those contracts, like I'm hearing, Starlink is going to be one way to address that. Um, will there be any, you know, any other approaches? Like, will there be any RFPs going out for this type of Def work, or are we just definitely? Going yep. Starlink once is once we know uh, what exactly is left to fulfill, we'll be going out to RFPs uh, to every company to see because we might have a road that Eastlink's on right now mm -hmm. that it's going to be more feasible for Eastlink to touch than Bell. So we're going to utilize every company that we can. We can uh, to get to work, local companies as well, to, to finish that last mile. I'm Valley Sherbrooke. That's all uh, for, for this section. Shall the section carry? Total business development, 53951300 Shall it carry? <coughs> bio, food, tech, general appropriations provided for innovation and technical support to the food and bioscience industry, including the bio, food, tech facility, equipment, operational and maintenance costs, and salaries. The facility enhances the level of services provided through fee-for-service royalty and equity arrangements with private sector clients. Operations, $2,818,200. Total general, $2,818,700. Time Valley Sherbrooke. So it looks like there was a small bump in the forecast spending, but then it goes back down to uh, the, uh, the same sort of, or the exact same amount that uh, you had estimated in the previous budget. So just can you tell me what that little bump in spending is and, and why it won't be necessary again in the coming budget? Yeah, so, so this line is actually a grant from Innovation PEI to BioFood Tech. Um, and the $2.8 million that was budgeted for, they, they came in a little high. Um, so we gave them an additional 200000 in the current year to get them to break even. Okay. Um, and then next fiscal, they're working, we go back to the staff and um, 
they feel that they can fit within their existing budget envelope. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Uh, just a practical one, quick practical question. So, okay. Um, why was this grant separate from the other grants through Innovation PEI that are listed in the larger book? Biofood Tech is actually a subsidiary that's of, right. okay. of Innovation PEI. Okay, that's it. That's Shall the section carry? Total Biofood Tech, 2,818,700. Shall it carry? Total Innovation PEI, 58,382,000. Shall it carry? Tourism PEI, page 41. Corporate services, general. Are you seeing? Okay. Um, appropriations provided for records management, reception services, and office administration. Administration of 13,400, debt 43,000, equipment 19,000, material supplies and services 26,500, professional services 24,000, salaries 312,400, travel and training 6,300, total general administration 444,600. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Chair. So we have a number of provincial campsites on PEI, uh, of many uh, beautiful, wonderful locations to go and camp. Um, I'm wondering um, how have campsite, uh, campsite bookings performed over the course of the pandemic? I think it's the next section, Honorable Member. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Two sections, sorry. Okay. Hmm. Okay. Um, that's fine, then. Nothing in this section. Shall this section carry? Yeah. Parks Administration appropriations provided for the management and regional administration of provincial parks. Administration 12,700, material supplies and services 20,000, salaries 454,800, travel and training 12,100, total parks administration 499,600. Shall the section carry? Hi, uh, Valley Sherbrooke. Um, thank you. So, uh, in terms of the uh, um, it, uh, What's required to maintain the, uh, you know, this, our provincial parks throughout the year? Is there, you know, are you seeing any, uh, are you planning any additional investment, um, not in terms of capital, but in terms of just ongoing maintenance of, of the parks, uh, just to make sure that they are, you know, a tip top quality for, for all these tourists that we're, we're expecting in this year? Yeah, definitely. So that's, uh, that's a continuous uh, uh, project, I guess. So that is one thing that we're really focusing on. You see a lot of the parks have really have gone downhill over the years. Uh, so uh, as of last year, the, the staff is really focusing on tidying the parks up and providing feedback where the work needs to be done to provide input for our capital budget. You'll just see in the, in the next section, uh, we cover off some maintenance and you'll see some increases there related to that. Okay. Time Valley Sherbrooke. That's all. Thank you. Shall the section, Olivia and Vernas? Yeah, Minister, just uh, just on park operations, just Cedar Dunes Park with uh, all the construction and things that were going on, I want to thank you for all that, but the other side of it is is that I think we've got to do a little bit of landscaping to try to get that back uh, looking at half decent. And the other issue is is that because of all the damage, there's a lot of trees that have uh, blown out, burnt, or uh, died, and things of that nature. If we could kind of get a plan to either replant some trees and remove some of the other. I'm not sure, yep. you know, I know there's environmental sensitivities, but uh, no, we'll work all good work, but we just need to kind of take it to a little more to get it back in uh, shape. No, we'll work with environment. We had to do the same with Green Park uh, when some of the trees went down, so we've got no problem going up with environment and our department see what can be done. Holy River Ness, regarding this section? Yeah, okay, thanks. That's it. Okay. Shall it carry? Parks operations. Appropriations provided for the operation, maintenance, and upgrade of provincial parks. Administration of 168,600, equipment 66,000, material supplies and services 973,000, professional services 25,000, salaries 2,362,700, travel and training 81,000. Total parks operations 3,676,300. Time Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Chair. So, okay, so this is where we talk about campsites. Mm -hmm. The wonderful, beautiful campsites that I was going to talk about before. Okay, so um, I'm wondering, uh, has, have booking changed over the course, bookings changed at all, the performance of bookings, the number of bookings over the course of the pandemic, and do you expect uh, them to be affected this coming year? Um, we had a real good year um, last year in the campsites, and this year is even going to be better. Uh, camping and golf are, are significantly higher when looking for this year. Okay, honorable members, we are now at the end of uh, government time for today. Oh. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Michelle Carey.
Mr. Speaker, as Chair of the Committee of the Whole House, having on consideration the Gannis supply to Her Majesty, I beg leave to report the Committee has made some progress and begs leave to sit again. I move the report of this Committee be adopted. John Carey. The Honourable Member for Mermaid Stratford, the, the Opposition House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I ask that Motion 107 be now read. Shall it carry? Yeah. That's a new one. That's a new one. Motion 107. The Member for Mermaid Stratford moves, seconded by the Leader of the Official Opposition, the following motion. Whereas paramedics are highly trained professionals who are incredibly important to our health care system and are often the first to arrive in an emergency situation and provide life-saving intervention. And whereas paramedics spend years and tens of thousands of dollars on their education. And whereas paramedics across PEI are struggling with chronic understaffing, burnout, and post-traumatic stress disorder. And whereas paramedics are reaching out anonymously for fear of reprimand from their employer. And whereas Islanders' health and well-being are being impacted by the lack of paramedic coverage and whereas paramedics are paid less in PEI than in other provinces, and whereas privatized services prioritize the interests of shareholders rather than those of the, of the public or employees. Therefore, we resolve that the Legislative Assembly urge government to immediately increase paramedic salaries to be in line with those in other provinces. Therefore, we further resolve that the Legislative Assembly urge government to prepare a strategic plan to transition paramedicine services to the public health care system. I'll ask the mover of the motion, the member from Mermaid, Stratford, the opposition house leader, to start the debate. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise to speak to this motion. Um, so, Mr. Speaker, a government usually um, would use an outside service when they are trying to avoid addressing issues that they have limited exp um, expertise in. That, would us that is usually the justification for privatizing government services. Government would typically have a good government process to select uh, the right provider uh, through a tender, tendering process. They would then form a contract outlining the services the company was to provide, associate that with guaranteed levels of service and clear reporting mechanisms to ensure that the private company is fulfilling their end of the contract. Penalties or cancellation of contract clauses are included because not all partners act in good faith. Mr. Speaker, the contract with Medivy is not meeting Islanders' needs. I get notifications most every day, and I rise in this house during greetings. I've done it for the past week, sharing at least one situation in which Islanders are being underserved by um, ambulance support. And let me be clear, Mr. Speaker, I'm just selecting one each day. There are several times a day that I could have uh, rose and, and brought that up at other times. Um, and I've asked the Minister of Health and Wellness on this subject to take their concerns seriously because a lot of these issues are being raised by paramedics. He agrees with me that the service isn't good enough, but we're not seeing real systemic change within our emergency services um, and the support that Islanders are receiving. Instead, what we're seeing is this contract is being auto-renewed without even being reviewed. And let me be clear, this was a 10-year contract that started back in 2006, and it was started under the former Bins, Bins um, government. And then it was taken over by the uh, former Liberal government in 2016. That contract expired, and they didn't auto, they just auto-renewed. They didn't really look at whether um, Islanders' needs were being met. And for the last three years, we've seen this current government do the exact same thing. Auto-renewing contracts without ensuring that it's meet, that they're still meeting the needs of Islanders and the, for those services that they were contracted to do in the first place, that's not good governance. Mr. Speaker, emergency services is life or death. And we're talking about government contracts that are over $15 million a year. The level of service, especially to rural Islanders, is unacceptable. And this has not been just recently. It's been ongoing and systemic. Mr. Speaker, paramedics know the dangers of arriving too late or without the resources needed to treat the person in crisis. 
Paramedics know that care of Islanders needs to be the number one priority. The patients and the families have to be the primary stakeholder. So when health care is pro provided by private companies, the challenge becomes is that usually their number one stakeholders are shareholders. They become the most important stakeholder. Excellent. It's profits over people, and that is not what Islanders should be expecting for emergency services. <clears throat> Government should never enable this. They should never be a partner in that. Something has gone desperately wrong when we continuously award a company that is not that is so clearly not meeting their obligations to provide this literally life or death service to Islanders. Mr. Speaker, the service is inadequate. I've spoken about this many times. There's been many people in this House that have called on the inadequacy of response times in the service to Islanders over the, over the last number of years. So why do we go private in the first place? You know, if you look back at the history, this was many regional providers that got consolidated into one company. At a time, that might have been the right thing to do, and it might have been working for Islanders. But we have to ask, is it still the right thing to do? We tried, and they failed. Time to go back to the drawing board, Mr. Speaker. There's no easy fix to this, but there are short-term and long-term actions that the King sorry, that this current government can do to make things better for Islanders. And in the short term, that is negotiating the current contract, not auto-renewing it. There are several sections within that contract that if you asked paramedics whether it was being met, they would tell you that it's not. The minister has been clear that he's auto-renewing that contract for another year and he'll work on it over that year, but this government has had three years to do that. Mm -hmm. We need a guaranteed minimum service level encompassing actual response times and life support um, that is provided at the time of the call. We need to see accurate reporting, and not just on shoot times, which is the only level of service that's in the contract. It needs to be more in-depth than that. We need to be looking at what are the response times, not just averages and medium, because those are too easy to play with, Mr. Speaker. We really need to be looking at how are rural islanders being um, serviced through this contract. And with that comes reporting. And if we're not reporting publicly to Islanders, I've, I've called on the Minister of Justice and Public Safety to implement something called Code Critical. Mm -hmm. If we're not publicly reporting what the surface levels are for Islanders, how do they advocate no? Um, first, sorry, how do they know that they're being serviced well? And how do they advocate for better service? We have some of the best paramedics in this country working here in Prince Edward Island. And we should. And we should be supporting them in every way possible. And Mr. Speaker, right now, that contract doesn't allow them to work to the full extent of what, how they, of the uh, skill set that they have. And that's what they want to do. Like, imagine arriving at a at a at a emergency call, arriving at a location, knowing that. You've taken a long time to get there, but not because of anything that you've done. It's because we're understaffed and we're underserved as Islanders. We need details and we need to ensure that there's penalties in place because when you privatize health care, you need to ensure that that service level is at a standard in which benefits Islanders. And if they can't meet that service level, that's not Islanders' fault. Islanders deserve to, to receive that type of that type of health care. Instead of renewing the contract with no changes, just like the former Liberal government did, I mean, you could sit down now, you could renew it for a month and you could sit down now and you could start going through it with paramedics to see how we could do this better. But it doesn't look like that's what's happening. And that hasn't happened in the last 16 years. So Mr. Speaker, we really, really need to look at the long term and what the, how Islanders deserve to be serviced for emergency services. We need to look at transitioning to public paramedicine. This service is far too important to farm out and not have full control over it. This is not intervene, inventing, reinventing the wheel, Mr. Speaker. We have jurisdictions straight across this country that have both public and private paramedicine. 
Um, and you know, we really need to look at what options we have. And that's why this motion is calling on building a strategy, especially to serve as healthcare in rural for rural islanders, who we've heard way too many tragic stories about um, what their um, service levels have been like. It's no secret that this government has failed in several other public health files, but at least when they are public, there is hope for effective use of public funds and accountability here in this house. We have no accountability when we privatize um, health care. We, vi we lose visibility into the service that's being offered. Private costs are far, uh, private costs more for less. So we might be getting a deal but let's be honest, at what cost to Islanders? An hour and a half response time to take niche? Like, we really have to understand what are we paying for? And if that side of the house is okay with paying for services that don't reflect the needs of rural Islanders, that's shocking to me. And we really need to start looking at what does a long term for emergency services look like? Mr. Speaker, there is no accountability because Medivy doesn't report transparent, transparently and they're not required to in this, in this uh, contract as it stands today. So Mr. Speaker, it's a pleasure to sponsor this motion. I look forward to the debate that's going to happen in this House today. I look forward to all sides' thoughts on this, but I really think that uh, um, a, a new strategic plan as to how we're going to be moving forward in the long term for paramedicine is extremely important to all Islanders. And uh, with that, Mr. Speaker, I will um, I will sit down and give everybody else uh, an opportunity to speak. Mr. Speaker, yeah. Oh, oh. the Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my colleague from Remade Stratford for those comments. It's a real pleasure to second this really important motion. There's been a lot of talk in the House, of course, not just during this sitting, but for many years about the criticality of paramedicine and the provision of ambulance services and paramedicine across our province. And while it's important that we note that ambulance services are utilized by all islanders regardless of where you live the issue that exists for rural islanders is that if there is a problem with the paramedic and paramedicine service and every day in this house my colleague from mermaid stratford stands up and gives a, a report on issues with accessibility and availability within the ambulance service here on Prince Edward Island. And when she does that every day, she doesn't just pick the days when there are problems, she does this every day. So this is not something that happens intermittently. This is not something that happens just now and again. This is something which is embedded, something which is um, something which is structural within the system. And the problems get magnified for those of us who live in rural areas. <clears throat> And again, it's not strictly a rural problem, but the problems become more of a concern the further you are from our, our major hospitals. We're a rural province, um, a, a, a more rural province than any other in our country. More than 50% of Islanders still live in rural areas and the majority of MLAs who sit in this house represent, at least in part, a district which has large rural portions. And we care deeply about those constituents and the areas that we serve. We care about ensuring that all islanders, and including rural islanders, receive equitable services, whether that's access to education, whether it's the quality of their roads, whether it is library service, whether it is access PEI service, or whether it is access to good health care, and that's primary health care through access in rural clinics, and it's access to good paramedical care. And it's critical that we do that. Island MLAs fight hard to ensure that those of us who represent rural districts, that rural islanders receive equitable services. And we do that every day in this house. 
private companies are not like that. MetaV doesn't do that. MetaV does not have the same sort of connection or love or respect for our small towns and our small villages as rural MLAs do. And that, that's an issue. That creates an issue because this motion is about ensuring that rural islanders have access to a critical service, a, a literally, in this case, a life and death, death service that serves all islanders. And it matters. It really matters. There are certain moments in our lives that we remember vividly that are sort of seared in our memory, certain trips that we make, whether that's um, to the church the day we get married, if it's to a hospital the day one of your children is born, to a funeral home or a palliative care unit when you're, use, when you're um, losing a loved one, whether it's abroad to meet family members. Those trips are forever part of your memory. And often a trip in an ambulance falls into that category as well. Not every trip, but certainly a large number of ambulance trips are life and death situations. And you remember that. Um, and I personally can remember not being in the ambulance myself, but following an ambulance on an occasion like that. It's as if it happened yesterday, although it's many, many years ago now. So ambulance, ambulances matter. The provision of ambulance services across this island matters. And the overall treatment of the paramedics who provide that ambulance service is really critical. Um, and we need to make sure that those that are providing that paramedicine, and as my honorable colleague from Mermaid Stratford has already pointed out, we have some of the finest paramedics in the country practicing here on Prince Edward Island. And we have to make sure that these highly trained, extraordinarily important, essential professionals are treated properly, that they are being treated fairly and respectfully by their employer, and that they are recognized and valued for the essential service that they provide. And we can do that in a, in a number of ways, and Mermaid Stratford has already talked about that, and the motion provides some details in how we could and should do that. And one of the ways that we can do that is ensuring that we are competitive when it comes to pay, and, and this motion talks to that as well. And that's not, of course, the only issue here. It's part of a puzzle. It's part of ensuring that paramedics here on Prince Edward Island are truly respected and valued. And I, I, I'm going to stop talking now because I'm really interested to hear other people from other corners of the house speak to this, to this motion. Um, I think there's a general concern, again, in all corners of this house, and I've heard it expressed a number of times in asking questions from our side and in responding to questions from the government side and admission that there are issues and that we need to deal with that. And I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from others um, how, how they feel we should do this. And of course, I'm looking for support for this motion, which I think touches on a really critical aspect of that provision of excellent paramedicine for all islanders from tip to tip. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I do want to uh, thank the mover and uh, the Honourable Leader of the, the Official Opposition for as a seconder of this motion. And, Mr. Speaker, we've, uh, we've heard uh, comments here this afternoon over the last number of days. But first of all, I, I certainly I want to acknowledge, Mr. Speaker, that, that our first responders, and particularly our paramedics, are a vital component of our medical system, of our health care system here in the province of PEI. And it's been referred to, they have been referred to, Mr. Speaker, by both the mover and the seconder as some of the best. And I more than agree with that. They are the best. They are the best, Mr. Speaker. Their commitment to Islanders right from tip to tip, 
uh, goes, uh, it can't be challenged. It can't be questioned, Mr. Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition, uh, rightfully so, indicated that there's a number of experiences that we have throughout our lives that stick out in our memories. And he referenced some. Mr. Speaker, I am going to stick to some, and I'm glad, uh, I appreciate that the Leader of the Opposition did bring that forward, Mr. Speaker. Uh, it wasn't in the notes here, but it, uh, it brought back memories of my experience with paramedics and just the tremendous uh, service that was provided. Uh, first of all, Mr. Speaker, I, I did have uh, the opportunity to ride to be taken from Prince County Hospital to Moncton Hospital a number of years ago, Mr. Speaker. It was an emergency situation, and I could not have been looked after better than by the paramedics that were with me in that ambulance on that trip, Mr. Speaker. Second to none, without a doubt. It wasn't that long after that, Mr. Speaker, and I know every member in this House uh, knows uh, the great pride, I'll be honest, the great pride uh, and uh, an affection and love that I have for my dad. The closest probably that, uh, and an amazing man that I am so blessed and fortunate to still have as part of my life. But uh, a number of years ago, my dad had to be transferred again from Prince County Hospital to Moncton for emergency surgery. Uh, as the leader of the opposition had referred to, that he had to follow an ambulance at, at one point in time, uh, if I recall correctly, with a loved one uh, in that ambulance. Oh, I followed the ambulance over. I was there uh, sh very shortly after uh, that Dad was admitted uh, to the hospital. And again, the service, the caring that was provided by those paramedics and certainly by all the staff, uh, both at Prince County Hospital, uh, before he went to Prince County up in the western part of the province, Mr. Speaker, and by the healthcare professionals over in Moncton, too. Again, second to none, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, as, as operators of the island's health system, the Department of Health and Wellness and Health PEI, we have a duty, we have a responsibility to always look for ways to improve and modernize delivery of paramedic services, Mr. Speaker. Paramedicine is an essential medical service, and paramedicine is an important public service, no matter, Mr. Speaker, no matter who delivers it. We know, Mr. Speaker, that salaries and working conditions, including workload, are a concern for paramedics, and very understandably so, Mr. Speaker a concern for paramedics as they are for all people. We want to make sure that we offer a job environment and a pay scale that will attract skilled people, provide a good quality of life, and allow them to stay and work as valued providers of health care in this province. And when I say, Mr. Speaker, attract skilled people, we do have skilled people. Another component of that, though, certainly is uh, we've seen it right across the spectrum in the health care, the delivery of health care services. There's the two aspects of it. Certainly, recruitment, extremely important, and that goes to the attraction that I have stated here, but also the retention, Mr. Speaker, uh, which, in, in my opinion, is every bit as important. Mr. Speaker, people, professionals, paramedics have a right to expect comparable conditions and benefits to their colleagues in other provinces. Mr. Speaker, 
Prince Edward Island paramedics currently do operate in a unionized environment with a collective agreement. As they enter a new bargaining period, I am sure that there will be interest in bringing their salaries in line with their regional peers. We have seen cost of living increases recently, and I am confident, optimistic, that the union will advocate for increased pay. Mr. Speaker, our government and the service provider are working to make sure that we have the needed personnel to staff our paramedic services. Holland College is training paramedics every year, and our system is prepared to take on paramedics to add to the strength of our system. And Mr. Speaker, it has been uh, asked of me, uh, you know, have I talked with paramedics? Have I talked with Holland College? Have I talked with uh, the provider of the service? And Mr. Speaker, yes, the answer to that is I have talked with all three. We have to look at our partners, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, as, uh, as I have, I uh, believe, mentioned, uh, brought forward here in the legislature previously, that there are 18 paramedics who are graduating, due to graduate this year, finishing their courses in April. Uh, Mr. Speaker, they have been reached out to, and 11 of those 18 have commenced training with, uh, with Island EMS. In addition uh, to those 11, there are others who have given a, a very strong interest, Mr. Speaker, in being part of the healthcare system here in PEI as paramedics. Over and above that, Mr. Speaker, there are two individuals, two paramedics, who have recently moved here from out of the province, who are, and I am optimistic, uh, they breached out, that they are going to be part of our health care delivery service as well. Does that mean that we're content to sit pat at 13? If a need is there, no. We cannot sit pat, Mr. Speaker. We have to look what the needs are on a longer term basis. I've heard from both the mover and the seconder with regard to, uh, to rural PEI. And I've heard it from uh, my uh, counterparts from the western part of the province. And, you know, we may have debate here, we do have debate here on an ongoing basis, but I know all of us, especially those from rural parts of the province, and I do uh, applaud the ones from Charlottetown, from Summerside, from our more urban sectors or sections, that they too have taken on and stand up for rural PEI. Mr. Speaker, I will always do my very best to stand up for all islanders, but certainly for islanders in the rural part of our province, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, going back to uh, what uh, I had referred to as far as uh, the number of graduates, uh, the number of ones who have indicated, uh, provided the commitment to start their paramedicine career in the province of PEI. But we also have to look, Mr. Speaker, what are other initiatives that we can take as a government? And uh, I had mentioned that I have had discussions with Holland College, will continue to have discussions with Holland College with regard to uh, initiatives that we uh, can take outside of the greater Charlottetown area. Mr. Speaker, back uh, in uh, 2019, one of the programs that was brought to Western Prince Edward Island was the Human Services Program. We were told, no, it can't be provided out of West Prince, Mr. Speaker. Can't be provided out of West Prince because you'll never have enough ones to fill the seats. Well, Mr. Speaker, it was put on once. A second intake, a third intake, a fourth intake, and those seats have always been filled. So what that tells me, Mr. Speaker, is that we can look not only at providing these courses, this training in Charlottetown, 
that it can be provided outside of the Greater Charlottetown area too. It can be provided in uh, in Kings County, in rural Kings County. It can be provided in Western PEI, Mr. Speaker. So those are the types of conversations, Mr. Speaker, that I am having and will continue to have. I've heard uh, that uh, you know the area said it is the greatest challenge to staff and to recruit paramedics to are our rural areas of the province, Mr. Speaker. And I've asked, well, why is that? And what I'm told is it's one reason, and one reason only, is that because the course is not offered in our rural areas. That it's, uh, and I'll adjourn debate. Mr. Second. Speaker. Seconded by the Minister of Social Development and Housing. Sure, Carrie. 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 <clears throat> the Honourable Member from Royal Dona and the Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I move uh, motion 94 or 90. 94, we call. Shall I carry? Mr. Speaker, motion 94 is currently under debate, and debate was adjourned by the Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. The Honorable Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, as I remember it, we were debating uh, about the creation of an access PEI site in Cornwall, and I was talking about how that would have benefited many of the people who live in my district, District 17, which is just to the west of Cornwall. <clears throat> and in my remarks to the, oh, excuse me, one of my dogs is trying to get enhanced. Um, one, one, uh, one of the remarks that I made during the debate for the previous motion was to do with, uh, the provision of equitable services in rural Prince Edward Island. And of course, um, Access PEI provides a wide range of services for Islanders, and it's important that, that we do provide that in, a, in as equitable a fashion as we can. And there is a bit of a, um, a, a black hole, if I can put it that way, between the Access PEI site in Charlottetown, which of course is on the bypass, on the, the, uh, the eastern end of the bypass, on the Stratford side of the bypass, if I can put it that way, and probably reasonably accessible for those who, who drive from the Stratford portion of the capital region. But for those of us who live on the west-hand side of um, the capital region, it's, uh, it's an extra 10 or 15 minutes to get from the outskirts of Charlottetown on the west side to the access PEI site on the, uh, on the uh, on the west side, on the east side, excuse me. So I can actually see the, I can see the benefit of having an access PEI site uh, in the Cornwall area. I think it would provide closer access for many of us who live in that area. Um, I think it's important when we bring forward motions that we are practical and that we are realistic in our um, conditional clauses the whereas clauses. And there's just one thing in here, which I, I think I need because of the debate of the day earlier uh, when we were talking about climate change and, and how critical that is and, and that we, we must do everything that we can. The claim that somehow creating an access PEI site in Cornwall is gonna have some significant impact on greenhouse gas emissions. I, I think we need to look very carefully at that. Any structure that you have, whether that's a built structure like an access PEI office or a school or a hospital or a home, or something like a car or an ambulance or a television or whatever, it all has what's called embedded energy. And that's the amount of energy required to actually create the thing in the first place. Um, when it comes to a car, you have to burn gas for about three years before you, um, it takes that's the amount of energy it takes to actually build a car. So if we're going to create an access PEI site, let's be clear about what the real benefits of that are in terms of accessibility, but let's not try and pretend that this is somehow a significant contributor 
to PEI getting to net zero because I, I, I would love to see the figures on that, but I, I remain to be I remain to be convinced that that, that is something of uh, import here. Anyway, I, I look forward to hearing others speak to this motion and I, uh, I am very grateful for the opportunity to be able to speak to it again. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member from Larry Inverness and the third party whip. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I too wanted to uh, talk a little bit about our access sites, uh, especially the one in O'Leary, Mr. Speaker. And I guess as you re recall, this is a, an initiative that sort of developed way back out of the development plan uh, back in the Alex Campbell times. And the idea was to try to uh, decentralize government services and allow them to get out into the more rural or communities and uh, to try to provide a certain level of service. Uh, I can recall, I think uh, in the O'Leary area, the, the very first regional service centre was actually considered called the West Prince Regional Services Centre at that time. And at that time, they hauled a bunch of mobiles in to the community and uh, tried to provide some services like agricultural extension, I know, was one of the services that they uh, were providing out of O'Leary. And it was, a, it was mandated to try to help all the farmers try to be, uh, to, to try to take advantage of the development plan, to try to modernize their farms, to, to uh, upgrade. They also uh, took the opportunity to uh, deal with the issues around social services and to try to uh, allow supports out to the people that were struggling uh, from poverty and uh, other issues that would be at the time, Mr. Speaker. And obviously, as you move forward, uh, I guess every community tends to want one, uh, one of those services. And uh, so eventually, services were added to Albert and Tignish, and uh, uh, I think Wellington got some services as well. But, you know, I, I would say what's, uh, what we provide for services tends to be more uh, accessibility to pay bills, to uh, get your driver's license inspected. I know. In O'Leary, we, there, there's, there's a person there now that helps with the, the free heat pump program, as an example, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, you know, so how much services does everybody need? I, I'm not, I'm certainly not opposing to say that every community wants one. Uh, and, uh, you know, by all means, but uh, these are the types of things that a government has to make the decisions on how far and how extensive and the services that it wants to provide. And it has to come forward with paying the bills for that, uh, Mr. Speaker, because uh, I, I know certainly in, in O'Leary, uh, you know, I want to commend some of the staff, the manager there, Cheryl Phillips. Uh, there's Mandy Phillips, uh, Kim McCollum, Cindy Gorrell. They are the core people of Access PEI. And uh, those people uh, are the ones that would wait on you for those types of services, getting your driver's license renewed, getting your driver's license picture, uh, getting your re re register your vehicle, paying your taxes, um, all those types of things, Mr. Speaker. And uh, I will say that those ladies are very professional. They do a great job. Um, and uh, even for myself, when I book my hours at the services center, uh, you know, or at the Access PEI, uh, you know, they, they book all my appointments. Uh, they, uh, when I go in, they usually have a list for me. I never know what my appointments are going to be in the run of a day, but uh, they provide me the list when I walk in, give me the keys, and I go into my office and, uh, and uh, start, the, start the process. Uh, I will say in opposition, I don't seem to get as many visitors as I did when I was in government, but uh, that's okay, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, don't, uh, I still like to try to help people any way we can. And, uh, I seem to always have, uh, you know, anywhere from two to five people every uh, Monday when I do my uh, hours at Access PEI. But I think the one, the one other thing that I do find uh, incredibly important for me as an MLA when we have an Access Center in my community uh, is the issue I, I get a chance to have a chat with all of the different uh, departments there. So invariably there's always somebody who will knock on my door and say, how's things going? And they're probably a person from social services, Mr. Speaker. And there's probably staff. Social services probably has 10 or 11 people that work there. Uh, uh, most of them tend to be coming and going. They're usually people from, uh, from the other end of the island that travel up. They don't get there till 10 o'clock, but they get there. And uh, they uh, uh, are usually using the positions as a stopgap to get to a better position closer to Charlottetown or Summerside, and that's fine. I, don't, I understand the Public Service Commission and how that works, Mr. Speaker. But 
I do have a few people that are constituents and they'll drop in and, and it's always nice to keep tabs on how things are going in social services and you hear lots of stories. I heard that when we were in government too, you know, as an MLA you'll get some of the, the situations that they'll bring to your attention. I mean we don't talk about specifics as far as an individual but, uh, but I find that's always very uh, helpful and uh, I will say that uh, if I just take that section of the department it seems to be uh, deteriorating in its uh, uh, levels of services and frustration that the staff seem to be having with this current government, Mr. Speaker. They're not, they're not happy at all uh, in the level of service and uh, the indications that they're getting. So, so I, you know, that, but that I find is very helpful. Uh, another uh, another uh, section that I tend to uh, always touch base with uh, are sports uh, entities, Mr. Speaker. The Western Sports Council has an office there and uh, also uh, uh, there's staff with the health and wellness uh, that uh, deal with uh, recreation. They have their offices there, Mr. Speaker. And uh, once again, I always kind of get an update. What's going on in the recreation within, the, within uh, my region and uh, that type of thing. Another issue that I've, I've had a, brought to the attention, I've brought it to the Minister of Agriculture and Land a numerous times, Mr. Speaker. One, once again, at the Access Center area, area, you could apply to get a building permit, Mr. Speaker, as well as getting your septic tank permits. And, and, and the whole concept was have all these services in one spot, and it's one-stop shopping. But once again, Mr. Speaker, this government has, once again, taken people away. We're seeing them leave. We're seeing them being transferred. Positions going to Summerside. Now, I've been lobbying the minister, and I, the minister's an honorable person, and I'm confident we'll see these, some of these positions reinstated. But, you know, if I take building permits in, uh, in my area, for this is for all of Western PEI, they used to have one and a half positions. And they couldn't keep up, Mr. Speaker. And first thing, all of a sudden, one person leaves for another position. Now I'm down to a half position. Building permits take five months. I know we, we challenge the minister on the floor of the legislature here with uh, that level of service. And he goes, oh, no, it's not five months. First thing, I've got a whole bunch of other animals. It is five months. It is, you know. <laughs> yeah, and maybe longer, Mr. Speaker. Horrendous, horrendous level of service. You know, so, uh, so these are the types of things that we have to make sure that whether it's Cornwall is getting a level of service, which I admire and I appreciate all of that. But is it going to dilute again from everybody else and we're going to have even worse service when we get more services out there? Uh, you know, we have to think about this, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, we have an environmental conservation officer that's up there. Once again, it's always, the, all these people kind of come, they come through every Monday and how's things going and I get a little update on types of issues that they are dealing with. It could be a, a deer landed on the beach at West Point, or I think it was a moose one time. We had a moose at the beach at West Point. Well, what a job, Mr. Speaker, to try to get the bloody moose moved. This government couldn't think that Bullwinkle shows up on the shores of PEI and these guys can't get him moved. <laughs> but two or three days later, after some threats that I was going to actually dig the bloody moose up and take it down and drop it at the steps of the Department of Environment's office, but I find out, what, once again, when these things happen, Mr. Speaker, you find out what's the problem here. They haven't increased the fees to, that they could take a, a bull moose and bury it, couldn't get a contractor, contractors are all busy, and they were offering them, I think it was like a hundred bucks or something to go bury a moose. Well, you know, that, <laughs> that's got to, you got to provide some services here, Mr. Speaker. We can't, we can't have a, a drowned moose on the, on the front of the West Point Lighthouse. <laughs> and that's what was, that happened. I got pictures. <laughs> yes, a drowned moose. On the, on the, <laughs> this happened last year. And, and uh, so, but once again, Mr. Speaker, it's important that we, we identify these things. Yeah, this time if they were having the breakwater in West Point, we might be able to crush them up in the rocks a bit, and, <laughs> and it might not be quite so bad. But, you know, another, another level of service that we provide that uh, the service center at Access PEI in O'Leary is uh, the issue around uh, uh, family violence prevention, a very serious issue, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, I, you know, I once again commend those workers uh, that work at that. I, I remember... Uh, 
uh, a co-worker of mine uh, in a previous employment, uh, Valerie Small, used to do that for years, Mr. Speaker. She's has since retired. Uh, but once again, now with working from home, those, those uh, offices are empty, Mr. Speaker. And that's something that I see as a trend. We're starting to see offices, less, less people at the access center, less offices uh, there. Uh, people are more working from home and or people in positions have been transferred to uh, other locations. And, and that was one of my comments that I said to the Premier. You know, it's important that we are distributing these jobs across Prince Edward Island, that they're delivering government services and uh, people get what they're generally entitled to as far as, uh, you know, the reduced transportation that it takes, the one-stop shopping that you could get at a particular government service. And this is something that I've always, I've always sort of said, this is the difference you get into as a, as a rural MLA versus an urban MLA. I always sort of say, everybody in my district knows me, for whether rightly or wrongly, good or bad, they all know me. They, they, don't, they don't have, uh, you know, when they go to the soccer games, that there's a whole lot of government workers, uh, we call them the bureaucracy, uh, that they can sometimes pull aside and have a chat with and say, you know, can I get this application done or, or what's the process to be eligible for that particular program. In my case, they seem to all come to me first. And then I kind of try to distribute them out, go see this department, go see that uh, uh, person and the, here's the phone number or whatever it might be. But that creates extra work and it creates, uh, they don't have the contacts of the uh, ways to access information. So that's, that's something I always find is important when we deal with uh, providing services in rural communities. Uh, uh, so I think that's, uh, that's certainly uh, you know, where I, I sort of look at. And I think it's really important, you know, when I, I've been around for a while, I've worked actually at the Access Center in O'Leary right uh, back from when I was in my 20s, I guess. I used to run a program out of there uh, in uh, youth employment counseling. And, uh, you know, I've seen a significant decline over the, that period of time in the services that are being provided. But not only that, that concerns me more than anything, it seems to be less and less local people working at these locations. And uh, that, that tends to you take away the uh, people that, you know, friends and neighbors that say, you know, I, I, I think of a person that his name was John Buchanan, and he was the director of social services out of O'Leary. You know, if a person's thinking about they want to be a social worker, they had somebody to look to. They could sort of look to that person and say, that person's in my community, and they're a social worker, and they're doing good things in our community. Uh, it could be the electrical inspector. I think of, uh, uh, you know, Ivan McWilliams, that was a long-time electrical inspector. Well, electrical inspector's gone now, Mr. Speaker. That's not offered out of the service center in O'Leary. So these are, are people that rural community members can look up to. They know them. They can see where the, the level of service could be, and it's a goal and ambition. But when we get nothing but people that are coming from other communities, they're farther away or they're traveling, uh, that tends, we tend to lose that uh, possibility, Mr. Speaker. So I think that's why I certainly would encourage Premier and, and government to, to always be looking at where there are opportunities that we can distribute workers and then hopefully encourage local people to take these jobs, Mr. Speaker. So if the member from Cornwall Meadowbank, I, I get the aspiration. He's probably trying to do the same thing I'm trying to do. Now, he represents the most prosperous uh, riding and community in the island, and I happen to represent the least of those, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I'm not necessarily, uh, I'm not unproud of that. I mean, our community is what it is, and uh, uh, we are moving forward, and we are getting better, and I'll say all governments have uh, contributed, uh, whether it's things like we talked about the West Point Lighthouse and trying to create the economic stability of that structure that we can make it as a, an important uh, location in our community to attract the economic activity, uh, whether it's the, the windmills at, uh, you know, West Cape, I mean, that's, we have the largest wind farm in the island, that has created an opportunity because it's a good example where you can see lots of local people now are working there and they're, they're doing the repairs to the light out, or to the windmills and they're, you know, that, that's the type of stuff that creates a, a economic activity and it creates, a, makes a community a holistic and, and everything that it should be, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, so, so I always sort of say that, uh, you know, if you're going to have a lot of these types of government services, we want to make them as, be as consistent as they possibly can be, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we want to uh, uh, use the technologies that we can. Certainly there's a lot more uh, level of services of things that can be done online. 
uh, community like mine, Mr. Speaker, that tends to be a problem. I, I had a constituent in to see me yesterday, and uh, his issue was around, you know, we started talking, he's having this kind of tough, he's looking for a job, works at an EDA position, has been for, I think, 25 years. And uh, so I, I started, I, he was saying how things are costing a lot more and things are a bit tough. And I said, did you, did you uh, think about that uh, home heating program, Mr. Speaker, that the Salvation Army provides? I didn't know anything about it, he said. I said, okay. I said, well, I looked up the phone number for the Salvation Army and said, here's the phone number. His line was, I don't read very good, Rob, I, or, or M MLA. I, so, I, you know, I, so I said, well, I'll give you the guidelines of the program here. And, and I said, uh, do you, you know, want to go home and call them or how do you want to? I said, he said, uh, well, would you call for me? Because I don't talk or communicate that well. So, so I said, well, no problem. We'll give you a, give them a call. So I, I called and we, we kind of, I kind of relayed the information orally uh, to the, the lady with, uh, and she said, well, uh, could, could he uh, maybe get, get something sent to him uh, online? We'll send him an email. Well, he doesn't have an email, doesn't have a computer. So I said, well, how about we go with the old way, mail the, could you mail the application out to him? So she said, yes, we would. And they mailed it out, and I gave him all the information that he's going to probably be asked to get from his oil tag number, and uh, he's got to get a copy of his, of his income tax. I mean, there's quite a process that you've got to go through to get, the, get this oil in your tank. But there's an individual that would be, I'm quite confident, as their income is below 35000 as a household income, and hadn't taken advantage of the home heating fuel program. But you could see how we can intimidate islanders by providing technologies to people that are low education levels and uh, but yet you know that individual I know for a fact is a decent worker uh, all my time and previous to me the previous MLA always you know he always came for his EDA job he'd always come in about the same time every year he'd help fill out his application and you'd uh, give it to the access center because like I say they don't have that capability of doing things online so, uh, so we always have to be cognizant of that, Mr. Speaker, that when governments develop programs, we're not all capable of doing things online. We're not all uh, have the communication skills to do things over the phone. Sometimes it's nice to sit and talk with somebody to help get a building permit filled out to, to help, uh, uh, you know, apply for social services or know what programs are out there and available, Mr. Speaker. So, so I always take great pride in uh, trying to help my constituents uh, deal with those types of issues and always treat them with the, the utmost of respect that they deserve and uh, we do our very best to hopefully they are a little find life a little bit easier as they uh, as they go and in fact actually the one of the comments he made his uh, his oldest son uh, he just said uh, he's going to the armed forces and I said, well that's that's quite a thing now and so yes he just got accepted to go to the armed forces and uh, represent uh, his country and go under the training and stuff like that. And uh, I guess my only piece of advice to him, I said, whatever they ask you, you go do. That's one thing about the armed forces and the military. There's not much room for debate. <laughs> so so, uh, so I'm hopeful that this uh, young individual will make a, make a difference. And, uh, and uh, I, I think the armed forces is a great opportunity for any young individual to, uh, to uh, gain a lot of skills and training and uh, gain some employment while you're at it and uh, maybe have the opportunity to retire with at least a reasonable pension at a fairly young age. So, so I think it's very important that we look at these services but we have a strategy or a government has a strategy to where we're going to deliver those services and if Cornwall is one of those places Certainly, I don't have any big issues with that, Mr. Speaker. If it's Surrey, if it's in O'Leary, if it's Albert and Tignish or whatever, but government has to also, I also respect government and its uh, challenges that it has in trying to balance its budget. It seems like this, that doesn't concern at all for this government, and maybe they're going to get lots of money from their, their carbon levies. It's going to fill their coffers up pretty good. Uh, you know, so that's fine, that's fine, uh, but you know, we'll always be here to uh, provide that critical analysis and uh, try to figure out where all the money goes, you know, and that type of stuff, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, so with that, uh, I'll uh, conclude my remarks, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I wish the member for Cornwall Metabank 
uh, all the best. And uh, well, I'd maybe five more minutes. Can yeah. I talk? <laughs> I know you might want to hear some of this great stuff. Uh, you know, I, I wish we could talk a little more about. Uh, you know, trying to get the breweries to get making sure you can get your brewery license there, Mr. Speaker, or other things like that. Tell us about all the great things. You know, but, uh, but anyway, Mr. Speaker, I'm going to conclude my remarks and uh, uh, pass the floor on to let another speaker uh, provide their comments on this motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honorable Member from Charlottetown, Brighton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I certainly uh, agree with a lot of things that the member from uh, uh, Rio uh, Inverness just uh, said, uh, except uh, a couple of things, like uh, uh, cities, uh, citizens in Charlottetown, they know me too. Uh, as a matter of fact, just the, uh, just the other day, somebody knocked on the door. He wanted to use my bathroom. He was out from uh, uh, Point Prim and couldn't make it back home. And uh, I completely understood as uh, someone who can't go 500 feet without needing a bathroom, I, of course, let him in. Um, thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you to the Honourable Member too for from Cornwall Meadowbank for bringing this motion forward. I'm of course in favour of the members' riding getting better access to PEI, but I think he's missing the point. I think there should be access in Cornwall, but so should they be in uh, Stratford and really any other community in the. In PEI, I think every riding, if you look at it that way, as a matter of fact, the member previously speaking was was even talking about uh, having kind of a constituency office there at the same place, or maybe having one right already, which I think is a great idea because uh, what Access PEI is all about is Ireland is connecting with our government, connect to obtain the needed services. And I was really pleased to hear from uh, our Minister of uh, Transportation and Public Works the other day that his long-term vision is to, to basically bring uh, government service to these access places as a one-stop service where, as the previous member mentioned, you can, uh, you can get all the services you need. I think uh, the Minister mentioned eight locations. I think it should be many, many more, maybe one for each riding or maybe even more. It should, you should, you know, if you live in a community, uh, it would be a good thing to be able to walk to it. Uh, certainly, you shouldn't have to drive from uh, east or west to a central place in Charlottetown. We have way too much for that. We don't have any lack of civil servants and good civil servants, but most of them even though they live out in the country, they operate here in town. They should operate also out in our communities. So it's great that I now, instead of driving to the access center on Riverside Drive and waiting a long line there, now I can renew my driver's license or car license from my own computer at home. This is great with anybody with a computer and for those without a computer that can still operate one, there are computers available at some access centers and libraries, and that works well too. But not everyone are comfortable and able to deal with a computer, and even I sometimes need to speak to a real blood and flesh person. So there should be somebody like near nearby. Uh, one example recently, uh, uh, as I live in Charlotte's Hunt, I have good access to government services, but I had an issue with the federal government, and I went to the Jane Canfield building, which I actually designed, and I was kind of looking forward to getting inside it, but when you get there, it's uh, like a heavily guarded fortress, and they don't just let anybody in. Uh, and I got guided into a room that was full of computers, no persons, that was a person to show me how to start the computer, but no person to deal with. That is not the kind of service that I want, and not the kind of service that I think uh, we should offer our citizens. Um, so while I believe that Cornwall Middle Bank should have access, have an access center, it should not be the kind of central facility that we currently operate. There should be access PI centers with persons in Stratford 
and Cornwall, as well as every other community on PEI staffed with real flesh and blood persons, full or part time. That's what Islanders need, and that was, is what an effective connection between Islanders and our government is all about. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Hello. With this, I would like to, to close the debate. Uh, Adjourn debate. Adjourn debate? Mm -hmm. Adjourn okay, second. Uh, second by um, the member from uh, Charlottetown Belvedere. Charlottetown Belvedere. Honorable members, the hour has been called. The honorable member from Morel Dona and the government house leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I move, seconded by the member from O'Leary and Vernest, this house. Adjourn until March 30th at 1 o'clock in the p.m. Shall I carry? Carry.